All we've got to do now is to start pumping. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. I am your host, Marcus Whitman, and this is the episode many of you have been waiting the last couple of days for trying to get all caught up on all of the free agency March madness that has been transpiring. I know we say this every year, but NFL free agency has been nuts this year. I do think over the last couple of years, teams are more willing to make big trades, and that has definitely opened up the free agency market. But uh, it has turned into a bit of a festival here when that... uh, you know, legal tampering period opens up. And just a day after the official league year here, we have so much to react to. I'm going to be going in this episode team by team by team in reverse order of my basically free agency predictions show, just so we're keeping things fair here. Uh, I do want to shout out the community here for the podcast, specifically Rad Allen, Michael Shan, Ponzu, Chill Dude, and anyone else out there that have been helping get the timestamps on episodes like these so that people can click through, find their teams, find the teams they want to hear about. I just, man, it's a it's a lifesaver for me because uh, you guys are listening through the whole thing anyway. I'm not. So it's, it's huge for you guys to help me get those timestamps. It's huge for the podcast. It's huge for the community that doesn't really have the time to sit through a two-hour podcast. Um, So please do that for this one. Again, I would really appreciate it. And a special shout out to you guys. Uh, And then I am recording this as of 10 a.m. on Thursday. There will be stuff that happens after I record this, before it gets posted. It's just things are moving fast here. So we're trying to get caught up. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do another episode like this to, to catch up again. Uh, Because we are really getting close to the draft here. Um, But that's what the deep dive series is for, right? To really talk about all this stuff in depth uh, per team. Um, But uh, I do apologize in advance if I miss anything that happens uh, before this podcast gets posted. Or if I just missed anything trying to sort through my notes and and stay on top of all this. I think I got everything. But um, if if you drop in the comments down below who I missed, what my thoughts are, I'll, I'll try to get back to you. Uh, Maybe while I'm sitting on the beach in Mexico this weekend, but that's enough talking. Let's talk some more (laughs) and uh, get into this thing. We're going to start with the Las Vegas Raiders, who came right out the gate, really, and made the big splash of at least real free agency, not including trades. And that was getting Christian Wilkins, who I think got the most real money in this uh in this free agency period and that was that was really expected a player that is not supposed to hit free agency a player that hit the market because the dolphins kind of went all in special circumstances where they have a rookie quarterback contract uh expiring here and needed to look ahead towards that a little bit so they couldn't afford christian wilkins the raiders said yes please we will afford christian wilkins and i just can't put a big enough explanation mark on how perfect of a fit this is for the Raiders. Uh, A huge need. Defensive tackle feels like the last five years has been a big need for them. I mean, shit, like since Richard Seymour was there, it feels like it's been a need. So it feels that they had the money to spend there. That defense has been you know, kind of overperforming, right? Like they've had Max Crosby and then a motley crew of other dudes. Well, now they have Max Crosby and another like really quasi superstar in Christian Wilkins, but especially as a number two next to Max Crosby, uh, Christian Wilkins is just going to be the, the perfect little guy to the perfect little guy. Yeah, that's that's not what he is, but the perfect big guy to slide in next to him. Uh, The run defense is going to be spectacular there, at least to that side of the line. If you put Wilkins and Crosby next to each other, I mean, 
just let them go to work up front, and then you can let everybody else run to the other side. Like, seriously, you're not getting past those two. So that's going to be awesome. It's going to help you get to third down, where Crosby is obviously excellent. It's going to help you get a guy like Malcolm Kuntz out there who really broke out as a pass rusher, um, just making those early downs so much harder. And then Wilkins can rush the passer. He's a fine complementary piece to your pass rush, but he's much more of that that run stopping presence. He's not like a nose tackle or anything, uh, but he is, he is teach tape for stopping the run in terms of uh, just pad level. He's got these ridiculously rocked up arms. He's got hammers for hands. His ability to just stack and shed for the defensive tackle position is potentially the best of any DT in the league. So uh, just a great signing all around that whoever got Christian Wilkins, it was going to be a big W for them. And for, for it to be the Raiders, it's it's pretty exciting for them because uh, they are kind of trying to hang around in this AFC, it seems like. Um, and then they go and sign Gardner Minshew. I kind of like that as a signing. Their quarterback room is obviously in flux. Minshew, to me, is one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the NFL. You look at what he did for the Raiders last year. Uh, you know, uh, sorry for the Colts last year, almost got them into the playoffs. I just two, two years, $25 million as they figure out this quarterback room, kind of create an open competition with him and Naden O'Connell. It, it does just make sense. You're going to be able to design a similar style offense because those are two guys that don't really run a ton, don't have the strongest arms. Uh, but see the field, have some aggressive tendencies, will push the ball to Devontae Adams. It just makes sense. And I will say, it does indicate that they might like Bo Nix, because I think Bo Nix is a a more athletic uh, version of Gardner Minshew and, and a little bit of Aiden O'Connell, where he can do all the same stuff that they clearly want to do offensively, uh, just kind of you know play point guard, they want to run the ball, play defense, that kind of thing. But then Bo Nix could extend plays on third downs, uh, make some stuff happen there. It's it's just something to think about as we look forward to the draft and them still needing a quarterback. But the signing did make sense to me. I don't think that's an overpay, two years, 25 mil. Um, and then just some smaller stuff. They bring in Harrison Bryant as a tight end, too. Makes sense there. Uh, they brought in Luke Getze. And uh, they're going to have him as kind of a wing tight end, too, if – if he wins that job, uh, it's fine. One here's $3 million. Don't need to spend much time there. They also re-signed Andre James. I'm not going to talk about a ton of re-signings because uh, for the most part, it's you know par for the course. I like retaining your players for the most part. Uh, I will point it out if I don't like a re-signing. But I, I don't think there was a re-signing this year that I was like, oh, why did you bring him back at that price? I think most of the re-signings were pretty good. But they do lose Jermaine Illuminor. It's going to create a huge need at right tackle. Another thing to consider for the draft there. And then they also released Jimmy G, Hunter Renfro, just cleaning up house a little bit there from uh, kind of the former regime. So I like the Raiders offseason quite a lot. Should be setting them up to be a, a, a scrappy, frisky, competitive team that if quarterbacks get hurt and that seven seed opens up, the Raiders just might be in the mix there. Uh, but then we've got the L.A. Chargers, who have been really quiet. I mean, usually when a new coach, a new GM comes in, it's it's roster turnover, it's signing small-level players, releasing dudes. It's not really the case with the Chargers, but it does make sense. They did not have a lot of cap flexibility. The screenshot was going around where they had four of the top ten cap hits in the NFL, and... One of those was uh, four of the top 10 non-quarterback cap hits, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, uh, uh, Khalil Mack, and Joey Bosa. So they're trying to get under the cap. They did make a couple nice signings that do line up with what we expect to be the case with this Harbaugh regime coming in, right? They signed Greg Roman as the offensive coordinator. Harbaugh coming in, you know they're going to want to get more physical and run the ball a lot more. So they get a run-blocking tight end in Will Disley, who's one of the better run-blocking tight ends in the league. Like that signing for them. They let their undersized athletic tight end go in Gerald Everett. And then they bring in Gus Edwards, like complete opposite of... Austin Eckler as a running back in terms of style. But, uh, you know, those were pretty predictable. 
par for the course signings. Uh, they also brought Aloe Gilman back. I like that. Gilman played fantastic for them. Uh, he can totally do like what Geno Stone did in this Ravens-inspired defense this year. And then they let Mike Williams go. That was very much expected. I don't have a lot to add on that from the Chargers case. Uh, we had a we had a feeling that that spot was going to be opening up, but that was a move they meet, made to clear up some cap space here. And they still have some work, I think, to do to get under the cap with restructures and stuff. And you would think they will do something with either Khalil Mack or Joey Bosa there. I don't think the both players are back next year. But let's talk about the Kansas City Chiefs, another team that's been relatively quiet, just kind of keeping guys in house here. I do want to spend a minute on the Chris Jones extension because we weren't really sure if anybody was going to be able to match the Aaron Donald contract. So this is a little bit off course, but I think a lot of people will appreciate this. And I know a lot of people understand what I'm about to say, but really the NFL, when they do contracts, at least in terms of when a guy is up for an extension, the NFL is going to look at sort of a tiering system. And Aaron Donald had set a new tier when he reached his extension for the Rams. Like before Aaron Donald was extended, the top tier defensive tackles were getting, I don't know the exact number, but closer to what, like what Christian Wilkins got, for example, like 25 million or so. But Aaron Donald, when he was extended, because he was so much better than every other defensive tackle, Aaron Donald got like $32 million. Now uh, we also saw this with DeAndre Hopkins when when Devontae Adams was up for his extension, that was part of what led Green Bay to letting him go because they didn't want to, you know, reset the wide receiver market is kind of what you hear. So we weren't sure if another team was going to uh, be able to match the Aaron Donald leap and if a player was going to have the leverage to get that. And Chris Jones has, I think, the fact that Aaron Donald is 32 and is regressing back to normalcy, if you will, in terms of being closer to a guy like Chris Jones or um, Quinnen Williams or whoever that guy might be, uh, probably helped Chris Jones' case to be like, well, Aaron Donald's making this. I should make that as well. But the Chiefs match it. I get it from a Chiefs perspective. I, the last thing I'll say about this is the Chiefs kind of have this Patriots dynasty type of vibe where now over what we've seen over the last couple of years, it's like they're going to coast through the regular season. They're going to try to stay healthy. They're going to play with their food a little bit. They're going to experiment. Um, but once the playoffs roll around, they have their go-to pieces. They have those things that they can lean on. And Chris Jones, over the last two playoffs, has been really, I don't want to say the reason they've won the Super Bowls, but I don't know that it happens without them. Like when the playoffs roll around, Chris Jones steps up. And I think that counts for something when you see that back to back years like this. So uh, I do think bringing him back made a ton of sense. And then they franchise tag Legereus Sneed. I think they're just kind of letting this thing play out a little bit. They obviously want Legereus Sneed back, but I think they understand that him being on the tag is probably holding them up from doing anything else at tackle or wide receiver. And there are, also, there are still receiver and tackle options out there. So it sounds like they're listening to trade calls, but I've heard as little as like a third round pick from the Tennessee Titans, potentially even a fourth round pick was on the table. If they're not getting a at least a second for Legereus Sneed, I don't see them trading him. I think they just bring him back and figure out tackle and wide receiver in the draft. So we'll see how that market kind of develops. Uh, and then the one thing that they did do that I was just kind of like, you know, I, I'm not going to question the Chiefs front office. Like they, they are hands down, like right there with the Eagles in terms of the best team doing this in the league right now. So I'm not going to question it. But they did have one move that I was just kind of like, huh, that's interesting was bringing Drew Tranquil back for three years, $20 million, uh, $19 million to be specific. Um, not that that's an overpay or anything. I think he's worth that. But for the Chiefs, you got Nick Bolton. I think Leo Chanel has shown in his first two years that he's ready to step up. I just, I, I don't know. I didn't think they needed to extend Drew Tranquil. You know, that's another starting wide receiver um, or a, a, a budget tackle, right? Uh, that could have been a, a Jermaine Illuminor or, or the Morgan Moses trade or something like that. Uh, 
I don't know. It's it's fine. It's not going to cripple them, but it was just kind of like, eh. And and I'm I'm biased because I'm a huge Leo Chanel guy, and I feel like Leo Chanel next to Nick Bolton is like you're good to go. Uh, but they like Drew Tranquil as a, as a leader of the defense and a blitzer. Uh, but they liked him last year on a cheap, like, one-year deal. This time it's a little bit more. So that was one thing they did that I was like, ah, okay, I, I don't think I would have done that, but whatever. Uh, they also brought in Irv Smith. We'll see if he makes the team. He has a total name at this point. He's been horrible in recent years when he's been on the field. Uh, and then Mike Pinnell is brought back as well after that big Super Bowl he had, the veteran defensive tackle. So the Chiefs have been relatively quiet, uh, but pretty par for the course for them. We didn't expect them to be be big players in free agency. Uh, Then we wrap up the AFC West with the Denver Broncos, who we weren't really sure how they were going to go about this with, you know, Sean Payton sort of taking the reins here. Uh, They released Justin Simmons. They dump off Jerry Judy for like a, what, a mid-round pick swap or something. To me... And then they really don't do anything in free agency. Uh, they they signed Brandon Jones, a safety, for like nothing. I'll, I'll I'll talk about that in a second. But this offseason really does kind of scream to me that Sean Payton just might do what he didn't do in New Orleans and just kind of take a reset year. That's the smart thing to do. And I do wonder if that means that if they're going to draft a quarterback in the first round, like if they're really going to just kind of take a reset year – I wouldn't be stunned if they just roll with Jarrett Stidham. You know, maybe they pick up a veteran backup that's still sitting out there. I don't know what what name that would be necessarily. But, um, you know, it it does seem to me like they're going to take a transition season as they should. But if that's the case, and this is being very critical, and I I definitely overreacted to this on the live stream for the Broncos fans that caught this, uh, but I still don't like it. They signed Brandon Jones to a three-year, $20 million contract, and I'm sure they can get out of it after a year or two, and it's not going to be really a big deal at all. But for me, it's like, if you're going to hit the reset button, why even spend that money? Like, you're trying to open up as much cap space as possible, and it's not like they're swimming in it, right? Like, they're going to have a 70-something million uh, dead cap on Russell Wilson over the next couple years. Um. And, and that's $6 million in rollover cap that you're just not utilizing. And Brandon Jones, to me, isn't even better than three safeties they have on the roster, at least two. So Brandon Jones has been in Miami. Brian Dable, uh, sorry, Brian Flores liked him as that box safety, kind of what they were getting in uh, Josh Metellus this year in Minnesota. But Brandon Jones wasn't nearly as good as Josh Metellus, right? And Josh Metellus was a seventh-round pick. Brandon Jones is a stiffer true box safety that isn't a great tackler and not a good coverage player i just don't think he's a starting caliber player in the league he is to me the definition of you wait till mid-april or may or till the draft ends and you still need depth at safety and you sign him to a one year one and a half million dollar contract but three years 20 mil i was just like Literally, why? You have young guys. You have Caden Stearns. They have J.L. Skinner, who they drafted last year, recovering from injury. You have P.J. Locke. I just, why? Literally, why? It's not the end of the world, but it was just a head-scratching move for me. Okay, the Houston Texans next up as we transition to the AFC South. Busy bees down there in Houston. I like what they've done. I think they've approached free agency the, the right way in that they're paying the guys that should get paid, and then they're looking for some some budget deals where they can find it. So, Daniel Hunter signing in, in Houston, very similar to what I would say about the Raiders getting Christian Wilkins. It's like, wherever Daniel Hunter ended, you're probably going to end up loving that. And what was interesting about this deal was two years, $49 million, 48 fully guaranteed the the Texans and NFL ownership it's it's hilarious they just they didn't want to be the first team to give a defensive player a fully guaranteed contract uh all right uh whatever 1 million not guaranteed but a uh, really good deal for both parties i mean in Houston to have him opposite of Will Anderson hell yeah sign me up for that with D'Amico Ryans that's him going right back to getting you know sort of what he had in 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 San Francisco with Bosa and, and Ebukam. Like I would say 
Bosa and Ebukam, Will Anderson and, and Daniil Hunter, yeah, pretty comparable. Uh, and then on the interior, they did do some stuff there. So they signed uh, quietly uh, Folu Fadikasi, who got released in Jacksonville. I like that as a fit a lot. Fadikasi played the same system for the Jets and had success. He's a bigger-bodied run-stopping type. Um, now, it sounds like they tried to bring Sheldon Rankins back uh, and got outbid by Cincinnati. So with that, with them sending uh, Malik Collins to the Niners for a seventh-round pick, this screams to me Jerjon Newton in the draft, like to the point that I wouldn't be stunned if they traded up a few spots to make sure they can get Jerjon Newton because he's like the final missing piece for that D-line. Uh, so that that was interesting that they would have traded Collins away before finding out if they were going to get Rankins back or not. But there is a hole there. Otherwise, like the other stuff they've done, uh, they they bring in Mixon, Joe Mixon for a seventh-round pick. I'm cool with it. You know, Joe Mixon on the cheap with Damian Pierce, who you just don't know if he can stay healthy, secures good running back play for you this year. Uh, They bring in Jeff Akuda for a one-year deal, kind of whatever. I don't think they view him as like a locked-in starter. Um, But if he has to start in that system, I think they're like, okay, we'll we'll make it work. I wouldn't be surprised if they also try to get Steven Nelson back still. And then the one thing they did that I was kind of like – yeah, I probably would have gone the other direction, is they let Blake Cashman walk. He gets t- three years, $22 million for Minnesota, and they sign Aziz Alshair for a pretty hefty price, three years, $34 million. I, I get it. Alshair is-, is more durable, and it has played that system before uh, back in San Francisco, had a good year in Tennessee. I think I think it's a fine enough signing, but personally – I'd rather just straight up have Blake Cashman than Aziz Alshir, let alone for $10 million less. Uh, But I do understand they really want to go for it, and that'd be pretty devastating if Cashman got hurt after they paid him. So I I do understand it's a, you you know, you're paying up to avoid the risk, and I I get it. Uh, So Houston's had a good offseason, you know, just kind of, I don't want to keep using the term par for the course, but we figured they'd do some stuff to generate some buzz next year, and especially that Daniel Hunter move is is big time. Uh, also like getting uh, Dalton Schultz back extended for that tight end room. All right, Indianapolis Colts. They've been – it's been a very Coltsy offseason, and, and they've been totally just focused on re-signing their guys up to this point, and that's really what I would have been doing if I was the Colts. They really, I had a tweet about this a few months ago. The Colts quietly had more starters hitting the market this year than anybody in the league, at least quality starters. And they've been focused on getting all those guys back. And I think that's the right way to go about this. They get uh, 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 Franklin, their linebacker back, who had a great year last year. I don't think people realized how good he was until they cut Shaq Leonard uh, and he became the true focal point of that defense, at least with the linebacking group. Really nice player. They get Pittman back. Love it. They get uh, uh, Grover Stewart back. Kenny Moore. They bring uh, an underrated player in, uh, uh, is it Daquan Lewis, the, the defensive end? So underrated that even I can't officially recall his first name. I think it's da- Daquan Lewis. Uh, but he's a really nice third edge piece for them. Uh, even Ronnie Harrison, who stepped in and played linebacker for them, they get him back. So they've just been busy re-signing guys and... I think that's a good way to go about it. They kind of let these guys hit the market, let them find out if anybody was going to overpay for them, and then they've been bringing them back on like competitive market offers. So good stuff. The, 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 they did make a couple of signings that I was like, okay, if you're going to spend money, that's where you want to spend it. Uh, Raekwon Davis, two years, $14 million. I mean, I'm sure the second year is fluff, but Raekwon Davis, I just – in Miami, he hasn't really stood out to me. Now, maybe they see him as more of that sort of Danico Autry slash uh, Ode Ingbo role where he's more of an end because that's what Raekwon Davis did at Alabama. He was more of a five tech, and then Miami's been using him as a nose tackle. So maybe they're just curious to see if he has better play ahead of him kind of in more of a 4-3 end fit. Uh, he would have to lose some weight if he's going to play that. So we'll see where that goes. But he certainly has not played like a two-year, $14 million player to this point in his career. 
Uh, and then they they bring Joe Flacco in as a backup quarterback. Look, Flacco had a lot of fun, but I just I wouldn't have paid Joe Flacco personally, especially if on the Colts where. <laughs> is Flacco really going to come in and be a really good RPO type of quarterback for you? Like he comes from an older regime and I don't recall Joe Flacco running a lot of RPOs in his career. Uh, And it's not like you have great vertical threats either for him to come in and just launch the ball to. So that as a fit was very curious to me. I know the Colts value backup quarterback, but I don't know. That deal was kind of like, whatever Um, we, we can move on Colts. Not not a ton to say other than just I like re-signing their players. Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm going to be honest, not the splashiest or best offseason. I don't think it's been a bad offseason, but just kind of a lot of mid-range deals to sort of talk about here. Uh, people wanted my reaction to them going to get Mac Jones. He's a backup quarterback for a sixth-round pick. I don't really have a reaction to that. It's not like he's going to D. De- uh, you know, I think people have gone so far on the, the Trevor Lawrence hate train that they're like, oh, Mac Jones is going to challenge Lawrence. Uh, no one's actually said that, but there's there's a polarizing conversation going on with the Mac Jones acquisition is all I'm saying. Um, he's back up and is going to have to go the route of Baker Mayfield and Teddy Bridgewater a couple years ago and be a backup. If an opportunity presents itself, play well. Maybe you can get back into starting conversations Uh, But in the meantime, they sign Mitch Morse, which at first I liked because, well, I still like it, but one of my main points on them was, well, if they're not going to be big spenders in free agency, um, this allows them to basically not let, so um, what I'm getting towards is, is the, this would have helped their compensatory pick formula they thought they might lose Calvin Ridley. They did lose Calvin Ridley to a massive deal, right? Uh, And what Calvin Ridley got was going to be a third-round pick, draft pick compensation back for them, which is basically what they're going to send to Atlanta for what they got for the one-year rental of Calvin Ridley. So to me, I was like, that makes sense. You sign Mitch Morse before free agency officially starts because he was released by the Bills, and that allows you to get a starting center without – you know, that impacting your compensatory pick formula. But then they come out in free agency, three years, 39 million for Gabe Davis, three years, 22 million for Darnell Savage, two years, eight and a half million for Devin Duvernay, two years, eight and a half million for Ronald Darby. They're not getting that third round pick for, for Calvin Ridley anymore. So, you know, just kind of like Jacksonville for me, their front office does frustrate me. And I don't think this was a bad approach. Like Gabe Davis, Makes sense as the role that Calvin Ridley played for them. A lot of vertical shots. I still kind of believe like Gabe Davis just needs that confidence. He needs to improve his hands. Could work out here a little more than I would have paid him, but not the end of the world. 13 a year, which it's probably, you know, more of a two year, $24 million contract. Uh, Darnell Savage. I mean, that one at three years, 22 million. That one I'm like, He's not a $22 million player. Darnell Savage would have been more of like the Jeremy Chin contract in Washington, where it's a one-year flyer and see what he can do. I just, I'm not a big fan of that signing. Devin Duvernay at at two years, excuse me, eight and a half million. That's fine. He's like the best punt returner in the league. So I'm not going to criticize you for signing that. Um, But as a receiver, he is redundant with Christian Kirk and uh, Washington, the Penn State receiver they drafted in the fifth round last year. So he's probably not going to see the field a ton as a receiver. And then Ronald Darby, two years, eight and a half million. I get it. They needed some man-to-man corners. Uh, but that's, you know, you're going out spending a lot of money. It's it's what Jacksonville likes to do. It's certainly not the splashiest offseason that gets me excited to say, like, oh, great, the Jags are back. We can get back on the hype train. It, it's not a bad enough offseason for me to be worried about the Jags, but it's just kind of like, Okay, um, you know, Jacksonville's doing their thing, a front office that I think doesn't always have. I'll, I'll end it with this. Like, I don't think the Jags are great at future planning. It feels like they're constantly just reacting to stuff on the fly, spending money where they can. And it's just like, you know, there's the, the best front offices 
see four or five months into the future in terms of like what's going to happen with their team, what's going to be the plan. Like even the Ridley thing, they signed Gabe Davis because they're like, well, we got to run out and get a guy now uh, in case we lose Ridley. But then they were like, well, we still kind of want Ridley. But if they sign Ridley back, then they're just releasing Zay Jones, who they signed for decent money a couple years ago. You know, it's there. There is all over the place as I probably sound right now recording this podcast. And I think that's an indictment of their front office. And I don't think anybody in Jacksonville is going to disagree with me because no one down there likes Trent Baalke anyway. Let's talk about the Tennessee Titans that I think are the biggest winners of free agency that we've talked about so far. Love what they have done. Uh, this year for them is is really all about finding out if Will Levis is the guy, right? They're in a very similar sh- boat, honestly, to where the Carolina Panthers are at with Bryce Young. Uh, obviously different investments in the guy, but they just they got to know heading into year three of those guys if they're the guy or if they need to go get a different quarterback. And for Tennessee, I think they set it up as well as they possibly could have. They get the offensive coach. They get the best offensive line coach in the league in Bill Callahan. They get him a veteran, smart, gritty center that fits their system in Lloyd Cushenberry. That was uh, I was ringing the bell on my live stream because on our last podcast, that was my prediction for the Titans was go pay Lloyd Cushenberry as like a perfect fit for them. So you guys already heard me analyze that and why that's so great. Um, and then they land Calvin Ridley. And look, I'm not the biggest Calvin Ridley guy as a number one for Trevor Lawrence, who you're looking to make a huge leap, or what he was in Atlanta having to be a number one for, for a year or two after they let Julio go. But look, here in Tennessee, where you have DeAndre Hopkins, you have a young quarterback who you need just, you need guys that can get open. You need this type of player is like the perfect complement for DeAndre Hopkins. You got your big bodied possession guy. You've got Calvin Ridley. Traylon Burks, if he can stay healthy with Chigo Conquo, can be those playmaker types. You've got a couple receiving backs with some juice now. Uh, you know, Tony Pollard, three years, 21. You pair him with Ty J Spears and just kind of rotate those guys. It's going to be frustrating for fantasy, but. Seven million for Tony Pollard when you're the Titans and you've got money to spend, bringing him home to Memphis. I'm fine with that. Um, so they just they're loading up on weaponry. I love that. You also still have, if he could ever stay healthy, uh, the, the slot wide receiver out of UCLA. I can't think of his name right now, but um, you know, deep wide receiver class too. They could still go out and use a second round pick on a on a slot guy. So I just I love how they're loading up putting themselves in a situation where, where they're going to be able to find out uh, if Levis is going to be the guy. And it's not like they went out and signed some some competition, right? I think they brought in uh, Rudolph to be a backup quarterback. So this is going to be the Will Levis show next year, and, and I'm very excited to see how this goes. Uh, they, they did make a couple signings on defense, nothing crazy. Uh, Shadobi Awuzie is going to follow Callahan. Uh, down, I can't remember, I made that drive once from Cincinnati to Nashville uh, last summer. And it's a beautiful drive uh, with a lot of traffic. But uh, anyway, Shadobi Awuzie is going to make that drive down with with uh, K- Coach Callahan. Three years, $36 million. I can't imagine a lot guaranteed. Uh, there's too much going on to truly keep track of all the guarantees right now. But, um, you know, it's a boomer bust deal. He, he was really good two years ago, tore his ACL and was not the same last year. But another year removed from that injury, you know, Shadobi Awuzie at his best is well worth $12 million a year. So, you know, I, I, I like that uh, in, in that secondary if he's healthy. If he's not, I would imagine they can get out of it after a year or two. And then Kenneth Murray, I'm not the biggest Kenneth Murray guy, but two years, $15 million, whatever, that's fine. Uh, so, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a good complement to, like, Jack Gibbons there who broke out last year as a run defender. Uh, Kenneth Murray is just kind of a run and chase compliment. It's it's fine at two years, fifteen million. So I really like what the Titans have done. Let's get to the AFC East, starting with the Buffalo Bills. Really, what we expected once those all those releases started to to reel in. You don't release those players, in my opinion, if you're just going to go and spend a bunch of money in free agency. I really think Buffalo is looking at this as a transition season. I don't know if they're fully committed on, um, on on uh, coach coach um, Jesus McDermott. 
for the long haul. But, you know, just getting some of these older guys out of the building, clearing up some cap space for more of a 2025 push. They know they'll still be competitive. Um, and, and, you know, they're hoping McDermott can come out, come out and kind of show that he is the guy, elevate this team, go on another deep playoff run when it's not really supposed to be their year to do it. But they bring back A.J. Epinesa. They bring back Daquan Jones. They needed some people back on this defense, so that makes sense. And then uh, they, I do like the Mac Hollins signing. They got Mac Hollins on a cheap one-year deal. Mac Hollins is probably a better player than Gabe Davis, if I'm just going to be honest. Like when he's got a quarterback that can send it deep as that vertical player, just like Gabe Davis, I, I'm totally fine with that deal. Um, you know, Gabe's got a higher upside if his hands can get get right, but you just can't really rely on him. So that was a nice sneaky little signing. If Buffalo, if the draft doesn't fall Buffalo's way in terms of wide receiver, I wouldn't be surprised if Matt Collins is starting next year on the outside and, and you know, maybe they draft more of a, oh, who would be a, a good example of a guy, you know, maybe a Jermaine Burton, like third round, more of a, a dart throw type that would be a starter next year. But Max a good player. Nice underrated signing for them. Keep an eye on him in fantasy to see kind of how the like obviously if they go get Xavier Worthy in the draft, Matt Collins, you can forget about him, but uh, I wouldn't be stunned if he's he's starting for him. He's shown to be a starting caliber player the last couple of years with the Raiders and the Falcons. Uh, and obviously in Atlanta last year, there wasn't enough offense to go around for Matt Collins to catch footballs. Uh, but let's get to the Jets. I like what the Jets have done. And I don't think the Jets are done either. I think, you know, they, they made the Morgan Moses deal yesterday. Love that deal for them. I we'll talk about that for Baltimore. I, I think Baltimore got robbed. It was a fourth round pick swap and a sixth round pick for really one of the best right tackles in the NFL, Morgan Moses. And you can lock him and load him there for the Jets, a familiar face. It was his last team. Uh, it, it was a, you know, I love jersey swap for morgan moses trade and it's just an old picture of morgan moses on the jets i always get a little laugh out of that but i mean it makes so much sense right they they need offensive line help that's all we've talked about for the jets so i love that as a signing for them and then they, they get a good backup quarterback tyrod taylor there i mean i love that because if aaron Rodgers gets hurt look tyrod can win on this football team this is the best situation tyrod will be in especially because they're going to retool this offense uh, but we saw Tyrod on the Giants last year step in for an even worse offense and a way worse defense. And, you know, his mobility allows him to make stuff happen. He's been in the league a million years. He's a smart player at this point. Uh, so Tyrod as a backup is a great signing. It's the type of, of move they regretted not making last year. Uh, so love that. And then, like I said, I don't think they're done. I think they have moved to maybe even – you know, you got Morgan Moses. Can they go out and get David Bakhtiari, right, who was released in Green Bay? I'd be very curious if that could work for them. You know, for, for Green Bay to release Bakhtiari, it made total sense because he's he hasn't been able to stay on the field with this knee injury. They were able to save $20 million in cap space that allowed them to do what they wanted to do there. And, you know, he's 33 years old. But... And on the last year of his deal, they just they wanted to go in a different direction there. But from every as a Packers fan, like I was reading about a lot about David Bakhtiari, and there was optimism that the cleanup that they did on his last procedure and the amount of time that he has been resting was gonna get him through the weeds on this. And it does seem to me like he wants to keep playing. And it seems obvious that he's gonna go. Sign with the Jets. It might even happen hell before this podcast gets posted. And I just think that's a no-brainer because if he's healthy, dude, like that's a cheap elite left tackle. The thing is with Bakhtiari, it's not like I would say maybe, for example, Ronnie Stanley in Baltimore where he's going through some injury stuff, but when he's played, he hasn't quite been the same guy. When Bakhtiari's been able to play, he's still been that elite left tackle because he's not a guy that leans on his physical tools. He's just the most technically proficient pass protector maybe in the last 10 years. So is it Bakhtiari? Is Tyron Smith in play for them? DJ Humphreys was just released by Arizona. I would not be surprised if they go out and spend money at left tackle as well. And then I actually like what they have in the interior, right? You still have, um, I believe they still have, 
uh, the Missouri center who's been there for a few years. I don't think they released him. Um, oh, it looks like maybe they did actually. They released, uh, is it not McDermott? Um, McGovern. Anyway, they did release him. So they don't have him. Still need something on the interior, I think. But, oh, goodness. I didn't even see this. They signed John Simpson. That must have happened recently between when I was prepping this and, uh, all right, sorry, I'm, I'm talking all over the place here, but I'd rather get it in than nothing. So they signed John Simpson from Baltimore. Decent enough starting caliber left guard. Like, did that? That had to have just happened, right? Because I, I thought I, I got all this. I'm curious how much that was for. Let's see. Because the guard market's going crazy. Oh, no, it's in there. They just don't have the details on it. Two-year deal. Details aren't out yet. But I like that as an option. I, I don't know that he's a consensus starter. I would still uh, I would still look at interior O-line as a need there. Uh, but you have Joe Tipman at, uh, at center. Wasn't great last year, but a second-round pick. You're hoping for growth. And then Elijah Vera Tucker stepping back in at right guard. Uh, they have a route now to really make this O-line look pretty good in front of Aaron Rodgers. Or are they going for a T. Higgins type? That's also in play. Uh, anyway, they have had a nice offseason for the offense, which was going to be their priority. But they've done some some stuff on defense, too. Like, man, I, I really they did lose Jermaine Whitehead. But I think he's a replaceable player, honestly. I really like the Kinlaw signing for a one-year, $7 million deal. He's obviously a Robert Sala guy. Kinlaw has had some health issues. He's had some kind of off-field maturity issues. But last year for the Niners, things started to look promising, honestly. He had really good pressure numbers, unlimited looks. And I like Robert Sala saying, look, man, We'll bring you in here next to all these pass rushers and let you go to work. I mean, Quentin Jefferson had a good year last year. I think Javon Kinlock can totally do that for them. So like that signing, just to continue to replenish that D-line. And then a couple pieces in the secondary to, to fill things out. They bring Chuck Clark back. That's why I think they can kind of stomach the, the whitehead loss a little bit. Chuck Clark was supposed to be a starter for them last year. He tore his ACL before the season started. Uh, so he should be fully good to go. And then I like the Isaiah Oliver signing as well. I think Oliver could play safety for them. I think he can play slot corner if someone gets hurt. I know he can. Um, but he also is a similar build to the corners that have worked for them, like Sauce Gardner, where he's a good press corner on the outside. Very versatile secondary depth. So uh, just a couple cheap signings there. I, I like what the Jets have done, and I don't think they're done. And I apologize for kind of talking in circles for a minute there, but... Let's get to the New England Patriots. Not going to be a surprise. I love what the Patriots are doing. I, I feel like I'm a little bit on an island with this whole, like, rebuild idea in New England. <laughs> I don't know why everybody's like, spend money, draft a quarterback at three, and try to win right now. Like, I just don't see that for New England. Unless it's Drake May. I, I mean, we've had this conversation a million times. We don't need to keep going down that path. But I... There were some people in the comments when I said I wouldn't spend a lot of money if I'm New England, and they're like, why? You have $100 million in cap space. And I'm like, rollover cap exists. You can roll all that money over to next year. Like, why do you think the Cleveland Browns are able to continuously add people? Because that's what they did a few years ago. But the signings that New England has made, I think, are very measured and make a ton of sense. You know, like I said, the money I'm spending in New England is really just spending on young players that I can see as a part of my future, and that's exactly what they've done. Michael and Wainu, they bring him back. There was questions on if they were going to be able to do that. Uh, the the move was sort of announced as a guard signing as well. I like putting him in as a guard in this new regime. Um, they bring Josh Uche back. This was one of my favorite under-the-radar moves any team made. Sounds like Josh Uche had a market to get more money elsewhere, but he believed in basically recreating that magic from 2022. I mean, dude, Josh Uche looked like Hassan Reddick in 2022, and I don't say that lightly. There was huge expectations for him last year, but Judon got hurt, the team went to shit, 
and it just didn't happen for Uche. But for him to take less money to come back to New England to reunite with the same system here that's going to be in place uh, with, with Gerard Mayo, I love that. And they got his perfect compliment, Anthony Jennings, back on a very team-friendly deal. So you're getting your young players back. You're re-signing those pieces. Like, those are some of the few players that this regime has actually drafted well in recent years. So to retain those guys is totally smart. I love the Antonio Gibson signing, actually. is a three-year, $11 million deal for the offense. You know, I'm not the biggest Antonio Gibson guy, but for what that team needed... Uh, absolutely. And, and three and a half mil a year. Like, are you kidding me? That's totally cool to pay Antonio Gibson that because he can, he's not just a, you know, he's an explosive runner and a, and a good compliment to Ramondre Stevenson as a runner, uh, but he's got piss poor vision. You can tell he, he was mostly a receiver at Memphis, but as a third down back, like, dude, that's explosiveness that this team just hasn't had. The screen game is going to be a big part of their offense this year. I think, especially if they're, I mean, we haven't even talked about Jacoby Brissett yet, but if they're doing this kind of run the ball, play defense, you're going to get a lot of screens involved in there. Love Antonio Gibson as a screen threat. So I think that's a, a really nice explosive option to put into that offense. And then, yeah, Jacoby Brissett, one year, $8 million. It's exactly what I would have done. Like, Jacoby is a starting caliber quarterback in the NFL. To me, this screams the Patriots are not going to draft a quarterback at number three. It's either going to be Marvin Harrison, especially after they didn't get Jerry Judy, or, uh, sorry, um, Calvin Ridley. I will forever get those two guys mixed up because they're like the same player out of Alabama. Uh, but, um, you know, that what they're missing for this offense is that number one wide receiver. They have, they have um, complimentary options. They have Kendrick Bourne. They have still uh, Juju on... Uh, Maybe they released Juju. I don't know if they can count on Juju, but you got Kendrick Bourne. You've got uh, your gadget player in, in Deuce Douglas. You've got a, a pair of running backs. You have Hunter Henry. Marvin Harrison's like the missing piece for that receiving game, right? Um, so I I just think if you draft Marvin or if you trade down to six and see if you can get Malik Neighbors or even Roma Dunze, like you pair that with Jacoby Brissett. It's a practical offense. You keep working on the defense with Uche back, with Jennings back in the same system. You know you're not going to win a lot of games next year, and you accept that. And I just think there will be a quarterback that emerges for you that is in the same breath of a Jaden Daniels, especially when you consider the fact that you put Jaden Daniels in. Like Basically what I'm saying is I think a player – like Jaden Daniels, will emerge in the future. It, it typically does happen, just as no one was projecting Jaden Daniels to be a first-round pick. No one was projecting Jaden Daniels to be a fucking third-round pick before this year. So that's probably going to happen. And I would rather take whoever that player is in next year's version of this Patriots team after you've figured everything out and after you've collected more draft picks or have put Marvin Harrison on the damn team. I would much rather take that quarterback on next year's team than Jaden Daniels on this year's team. So that would be my strategy. And for some reason, Patriots fans, a lot of them, a lot of them agree with me, but a lot of Patriots fans are like, you're a fucking moron. Like, it's a lock. QB's at three. And I'm like, I just, I, that's not the route I would go. And their free agency to me screams, no, that's not the direction we're going to go. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, they also had some nice little cheap, signings on, again, some relatively younger players, Armin Watts, Sion Taki Taki, still under, you know, I think those guys are like 26, 27 years old. Easy scheme fits, right? Armin Watts as a rotational, I mean, he's a scheme fit anywhere, but just as a rotational D lineman, Lawrence Guy retires, that makes sense to me. And then Sion Taki Taki, I think they still have Bentley and they still have... um to vie on the roster and less Bentley is a free agent. Hold on. Let me, I'm curious about that. Let me see if, so yeah, they still have Bentley. They still have to uh, but Sion Taki Taki is, is very much in that breath. He's their type as a backup at two years, 8 million or whatever it was. And a potential replacement for a guy like Bentley or to Cause I mean, those guys can't be under contract too much longer. I, I like that move for them. So just 
a very measured off season for the for the Patriots and for Elliot Wolf here in his in his first year running the team. I like it. Okay, the Miami Dolphins up next. Not a ton to report. You know, they they we knew they were gonna lose Christian Wilkins. We knew they were gonna lose Robert Hunt. They made their bets, right? They really went for it on Tua's rookie deal. They went and got Bradley Chubb. They went and got Tyreek Hill. They went and got Jalen Ramsey. This is them. They they didn't cash their bet. Now they have to go and pay for it, really. Uh, that's what this is. They lost Wilkins. They lost Robert Hunt. And they didn't have a lot of money to really throw around. But they did do some stuff to patch up the defense. I like the Shaq Barrett signing one-year deal. That makes a ton of sense because you have both Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb who you think are the future of of your edge room, but are both coming off of pretty major injuries, both guys that have an injury record. So I like Shaq Barrett as insurance there. Made a total sense, keeping him in state. Jordan Brooks at three years, $26 million. You know, with some of the, some of the deals going around, I, I think that's a really good deal. Um, you know, you got Al Shair getting three years, 34. You know, I think... Jordan Brooks getting three years, 26 for this Dolphins team that needed another linebacker makes sense. So I think that was totally fine. It's not like some massive contract that's going to sink your team. They also get Jordan Poyer on a one-year deal. So those those kind of veteran deals for guys like Shaq Barrett, Jordan Poyer, who aren't what they once were, but cheap deals as you kind of maneuver into this next, you know, you're still going to compete this year, but you're really maneuvering into – Honestly, the the Tua Waddle era, and and Tyreek's still going to be around for a couple of years, but you're, you're you're in a trans. You and Bu- and Buffalo, they're both kind of in a transition this year. I think, um, still going to be a very competitive team, but not necessarily their like their year window, right? Like like you would say about the Jets or uh, what I think the Chiefs might be going into next year. The 49ers and the Browns are like next year. We're like really set up well for it. Not necessarily with Miami. Got to think about the future at some point, right? Because they've been all about the now for the last two years. Cincinnati Bengals have quietly had a very nice offseason, which we say, we've say we said that about them now for like four straight years. Uh, this front office really does know what they're doing. It's weird to see people criticize them when they've, I think, earned the benefit of the doubt as of late. And they kind of started things off by signing Geno Stone. Right out the gate, I think they liked what he did against them for the for the Ravens. What's interesting is they did that because before they, I think, knew Von Bell was going to be released by Carolina. So Von Bell was in Cincinnati before Carolina paid him a decent contract. Uh, I mean, they love Von Bell. So I think when when he became available, they were like, oh, shit, like we kind of prefer Von Bell to Geno Stone. They give Von Bell one year, six million which is conveniently one mil less per year than Geno Stone got. To me, that screams that strong safety spot is going to be an open competition. Uh, what's interesting is Jordan Battle played well last year. You have Daxton Hill. I I would be fascinated if they might think Dax Hill could step out and play corner, do a little Byron Jones action with him. It's, it's something to consider, I think, because you have now three safeties in that room that I like. Geno Stone, Jordan Battle, and Von Bell. And I obviously like Dax Hill, but Dax Hill is a freak. I think he could play outside corner. So something to keep an eye on there it, as they have cornerback needs. Um, but that secondary is now very deep. I still think you know corner with... That's why I suggest Daxton Hill maybe to play a little corner for them, because you, you got Mike Hilton, you've got... Um, you know, you got the the second round Michigan kid they drafted last year. You have the Nebraska kid. Their names are escaping me right now, but um, they've got some youth there. So you don't have to play Daxton Hill out there, but they got options. It's a, it's a deep secondary. All of a sudden, like those moves, I, I felt it was necessary for them to fill out the secondary. But um, they did some other stuff, right? Like they they bring they signed Sheldon Rankins, pretty good payday. For Sheldon Rankins, two years, $26 million contract, really good year for Houston last year, was good for the Jets the year before that. I mean, Rankins has mostly been a really good number two defensive tackle when he's been healthy, and he's been more healthy as of late. So I like him getting, you know, boosting up that pass rush there. You still have 
uh, BJ Hill in, in there, right? It, nothing's happened with him. And Hill's more of a, a bigger bodied guy. I, I feel like I need to confirm some of these things. Yeah, BJ Hill's still in there. Uh, I wouldn't even mind bringing DJ Reader back, but that D line can that D line works for me, man. With with Rankins and Hill next to each other, and obviously the edge room is pretty good right now. So uh, they kind of stole him from Houston. Houston wanted him back, so that's a good sign for Cincy. I, I think fills a, fills a need for that defense, uh, and I, I think you know the Bengals. There's reason to be excited about that defense next year with with Lou Anarumo and those guys getting back together healthy. Uh, the young corners maybe taking a step up. But uh, for the offense, I like the way they're playing things there too. I, I think f- doing what they did with Joe Mixon makes sense, right? You flip him for seventh-round pick, a salary cap dump, really, and they signed Zach Moss for a two-year, $8 million deal. The tape is not that different between Joe Mixon and Zach Moss at this point. And they loved Sam- Samaj P. Ryan and what he did for them. They didn't bring him back. Zach Moss is very similar to Samaj P. Ryan. Not quite what he is as a receiving threat, but there's there's enough in there from Zach Moss uh, to kind of look like a good fit for them. And I think saving that money makes sense, getting younger at that position. Uh, although Moss and Mixon are probably pretty close in age, but I'm fine with that. You bring in Mike Kosicki, one year, $2.5 million. Mike Kosicki is going to be a best ball guy for me, and I might as well take a second. Uh, the TFG code on Underdog Fantasy is still live. If you guys want to sign up, they'll match $100 on your first deposit. we got March Madness coming, uh, so you can do your daily fantasy during March Madness. So if your bracket is fucked, you can still participate. Uh, but best ball is live right now, so if you want to draft rookies, if you want to sneak in there and grab Mike Kosicki in your best ball drafts in the 15th round, now is when most of the winners come from because you can steal value before these guys' prices go up. But uh, I, I just I think Mike Kosicki in this offense is really going to succeed. They've elevated a lot of tight ends. C.J. Uzama had some success here. Hayden Hurst had success here. Um, Freaking last year, the kid out of nowhere had success here. I mean, Mike Kosicki can really work in this offense where it's a lot of gun. I think he fits – uh, that slot position really well. Tyler Boyd is leaving. Like, dude, he could have a monster season. What a, what a good fit for him. And it was two and a half million for Mike Kosicki. That's huge. So just a bunch of under the radar signings. And I, I will say, I, I like that they're kind of playing hardball with T. Higgins. Like, he's not coming off the best year. I think, I think Cincinnati is saying. Look at the Michael Pittman contract. You're you're a similar ish receiver to Pittman. They have stylistic differences, but in terms of production, being a high end number two wide receiver, bigger bodied guy, look at the Michael Pittman contract. Like 23, 24 million dollars a year. I think Cincinnati's willing to go there, but I think T. Higgins thinks he's a step above that. I think T. Higgins wants 30 million a year. But I like I like Cincinnati kind of playing hardball here, like the Niners have done with Debo in the past. I just wouldn't be in a rush to trade away T. Higgins. I wouldn't really want a second round pick back for him, even in this wide receiver draft. If someone offers me a first, right? Like if Jacksonville's like, here, here's the 18th pick. We want to pair T. Higgins back up with Trevor Lawrence. I would take that, but I don't think that table's that deal's on the table right now. And as things play out, as things go on, T. Higgins might either agree to play on the tag or just, you know, come down on his contract a little bit. So I love that they haven't rushed to the table to trade away T. Higgins. I think that's patient and smart by this front office. So overall, very satisfied with the Bengals offseason. Then we got the Cleveland Browns. You know, I figured they wouldn't go too nuts here in Cleveland. They... They have cap space, but when you look down the barrel of the gun towards the future, it's crazy. I've tweeted this out, but, I mean, Watson's contract's going up, but the amount of good young players that they have as pending free agents is pretty crazy. So, like, I don't think they were going to go nuts, but where they've spent money makes a ton of sense. I love that they brought that D-line back and added another piece. So you got Shelby Harris back, cheap two-year deal. Zadarius Smith back. He's he's inexpensive, you know. The league's just not the biggest Zadarius Smith fan because he he makes a lot of noise off the field. You know, he's 
talked about wanting to take plays off and, you know, whatever. He's had injury issues. It reduces his price, and the Browns take advantage of that. Mo Hurst, back, another guy that's available because he gets hurt. But when he's out there, he's a great piece for that D-line. Honestly, a better player than Shelby Harris when he's healthy. And they add Quentin Jefferson to the mix, who just, for all the stunts and stuff they run, Quentin Jefferson is a a stunt man in terms of being D-line with his get-off as a kind of interior flex piece. So I love getting that defense back together. I love getting Jordan Hicks on a two-year, $8 million deal. I think he's an upgrade from what they had in Anthony Walker last year. Hicks was good in Minnesota last year. I don't get why the league doesn't want to pay Jordan Hicks. He's another guy that's had injury concerns um, throughout his career, so maybe there's some of that going on. And then offensively, the Jerry Judy trade makes a ton of sense, right? Brings another kind of number two piece there. You got him, you got Elijah Moore, you've got uh, Amari Cooper, you've got Njoku, you got Chubb coming back. No excuses for Deshaun Watson. Probably just a one-year rental for Judy if he has a nice year. If he doesn't, he'll be cheaper. So it's a it's a good acquisition. Really, nobody was questioning the Browns for that one. Uh, and then, dude, Jameis Winston on a one-year, $4 million contract? Hell yeah. Especially when Joe Flacco got more than that. Like, I like Jameis a lot more than Flacco as a backup. And I love that as a stylistic replacement for Flacco because Flacco came in, and what did we keep saying? Deep ball, YOLO balls aggressiveness right that's Jameis if Deshaun Watson gets hurt again or if he sucks so bad you got to bench him or if you know he does his thing and ends up in prison someday Jameis as a backup in Cleveland can win in my opinion just as Flacco did um, but even on on a higher level uh, than that so I love that and then that's really all we've got for them. So they've they've had a nice offseason for sure. They just steal value left and right every single year, and they're kind of doing that again. Granted, a lot of these are like injury risks, and even the like the quarterback they signed, like they're kind of a no risk it, no biscuit team right now. Uh, just kind of hoping everything comes together. You know, it's the Browns, and when teams get a bunch of guys like this that are polarizing. Usually it can lead to disappointing results, but the the potential on this team is stupid high, right? Pittsburgh Steelers have actually been pretty quiet after bringing in Russell Wilson, and I talked a little bit about that on the live stream, but, you know, at first my initial reaction was like, wow, that's a super mid addition for the Steelers, and I kind of still feel that way. But when you see the contract details, it's like literally why the hell not? It makes sense for Pittsburgh, who's not in a position to draft a quarterback. So you go in the next year with Russ and Kenny Pickett as the backup with Russ on a bit of a shorter leash. Like I still think Kenny Pickett can function for the Steelers. Um, Russ as a fit with Arthur Smith is fascinating because Russ doesn't throw to the middle of the field and Arthur Smith loves play action and attack in the middle of the field. But at $1.2 million, that's just too good of value to pass up. And if if they go through training camp, honestly, and it's not a culture fit, and it's not a scheme fit, and and Kenny Pickett looks good. Like, remember, Kenny Pickett had a lot of hype in camp last year. If Kenny Pickett looks good with a real offensive coordinator for the first time in his career, like, you can ship Russ off, honestly, at this point. At $1.2 million, if someone's quarterback goes down, you can ship Russ off, or you can just release him. It doesn't matter. So totally fine with, with the Russ signing. It's good insurance. It keeps them relevant if that's what they wanted to do. But there is definitely a little bit of that, like, you know, where the hell are the Steelers headed ultimately? Like, what's the ceiling on this team? Certainly is a question, but it's fine. Now, what I will say is I hate the Deontay Johnson trade for them. Hate it. I, I get that. I get that he, like, wasn't happy or whatever. I mean, maybe I'm underselling the situation, but to me it's like you've had bigger head cases that you've kept under wraps for longer. You've got a new situation. Like, winning cures all wounds in the NFL. And you bring in Arthur Smith, you bring in Russell Wilson. Like, you could have made Deontay happy pretty quickly here. And to get a seventh-round pick and... Dante Jackson for him like I think that's horrible value for someone that I view as a as a one of 
a number one of three type of wide receiver. I think Deontay Johnson's one of the 10 best route runners in the league. He makes tough catches, even if he has some drop issues, and you'll have to live with that with Deontay. But, dude, Carolina, when they made this trade, I guarantee they were like, how the fuck did we pull that off? We were like two minutes away from cutting Dante Jackson, and we flipped him for like the perfect wide receiver that they need who's going to get open for Bryce Young. So to me, this screamed Arthur Smith hates blocking wide receivers. The Steelers were done with them, and they were just going to dump them for nothing. The fact that they got Dante Jackson is kind of a cherry on top of whatever they were going about with Dante. But I hate that as a process because now all of a sudden you've signed Russ all of a sudden, I'm a lot less excited about that wide receiver group. I, I like Pickens, right? Um, I like Pat Fryermuth as a good possession tight end. But where's the juice in that offense? You know, like Deontay was a necessary evil to have because of his route running. Like Calvin Austin's not going to be that guy, uh, I don't think. I think Calvin's a good deep threat. But I just, I'm not a fan of that trade for Pittsburgh and some people said Deontay's overrated, and I just, look, man, he's been dealing with high school quarterbacks throwing him the football and and high school offensive coordinators calling plays for him. Like, yeah, of course he's not going to produce at a super high level, but, man, the tape is damn good with him and very excited for the Panthers to get him, really for nothing. Uh, the, then the really the only other thing they did was they signed Patrick Queen, I do think that was necessary for them. They have really struggled to find linebackers. They regret letting uh, um, uh, Robert Splane go. So nice signing. He didn't get overpaid is what I love about this. I was afraid that Patrick Queen was going to get the Tremaine Edmonds deal as a former first-round pick that had a a good fourth year. Tremaine Edmonds got like $18 million a year for the Bears and definitely didn't live up to that in year one for the Bears. Patrick Queen gets three years, $41 million. I think that's a good deal, right? Like based on where the linebacker contracts have been this year, I think 11 or 12 million for Patrick Queen is is totally fair, especially, you know, inner division. He seems like a good fit in Pittsburgh. So, I do like that. Um okay, we got one more AFC team and then we're on to the NFC. We are moving. So, Baltimore Ravens have really been pretty quiet so far other than one of the big splashes, they bring in King Henry. I don't have a ton to really say about it other than I love it. Like, I'm excited to see him really as just a better version of Gus Edwards in that offense, who was solid for them. And, I I mean, the biggest thing you can say about him is, I can't remember who, who put this out. I think it was a fantasy football guy, but pointed out that Derrick Henry has been the last two years 31st in yards before contact like in terms of basically what kind of blocking he's getting in Tennessee and he's still been top 10 in yards per carry despite getting hit right away Baltimore was first in yards before contact last year so the blocking and the way that Lamar opens up the run game is is really going to get him moving so it could be really dangerous and and a fun piece to add. Not just a fun piece, but like a, a game-changing piece for them. Beyond that, they really haven't done much. I mentioned it earlier. I'm not a fan of the Morgan Moses trade for them. I think he's worth more than that, honestly, even if he's a one-year rental. But I don't think he has to be because he seems to be getting more athletic and better with age, Morgan Moses. So I think he could be a, an extension candidate for the Jets. But, like... Even on a one-year, like a cheap one-year deal at, as one of the best right tackles in the NFL, I, I think he's worth more than a fourth-round pick swap and a sixth-round pick. Like, I think he's worth a fourth. Like, you, you couldn't have just gotten that fourth-round pick for the Jets straight up? Like, really? Uh, and they don't really have an answer. Like, O-line, Morgan Moses was the one piece that I was like, him and Linderbaum, I suppose, were the two pieces that you can, like, count on for that O-line. And they traded him away. Now, I don't like questioning the Ravens because that front office knows what they're doing. Eric DeCoste is fantastic, and and that that staff is mostly fantastic, but most of those guys left. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it's like they either really believe in Daniel Falele, a third-round developmental piece that they took a couple years ago, or they love this tackle class. 
But to me, you're just creating another need for what? You're not spending that money right now. Maybe they will. But uh, yeah, I just, it's been a while since the Ravens did something where I was like, really kind of critical of and this one I just did not understand so so that's just adding a, a high element of risk to a, an offensive line group that already has a high risk for next year so it's just not ideal in my opinion all right let's get to the NFC the NFC West the Arizona Cardinals have also been surprisingly quiet so far now I definitely don't think they're done I think Arizona is loading up to make a bigger splash or potentially to bring back Hollywood Brown, which I still think if you're planning on trying to get either Neighbors or Harrison as your true number one, I love him with Hollywood, with the other ancillary pieces that they've developed. I I still like the idea of trying to recreate some magic between Hollywood and Kyler, but um, I, I think Hassan Reddick... We'll talk about the Eagles in a little bit, but Hassan Reddick is as good as a Cardinal, in my opinion. You bring him home where he started his career, and you have Jonathan Gannon there, who obviously did fantastic things with Hassan Reddick. I've talked about how good Gannon is at scheming up blitzes and getting open blitz looks for these edge pieces. Hassan Reddick is the literal piece that this team wants. Uh, they've told us that, right, with the, the Dennis Gardick and... Uh, moving Zayvon Collins to the edge. Like, Zayvon, uh, Hassan Reddick will be a Cardinal within the week. I, 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 I know it. Like, I don't have any sources, but it's just everything adds up because the Jets signed Bryce Huff. So I do think that's going to happen, and that'll be more exciting. Uh, or maybe it's a Higgins trade or something. Like, I think they're still trying to make a move here. But otherwise... Uh, some steady moves. It's not that they haven't spent any money. They have. They signed Jonah Williams and released DJ Humphreys. So, you know, I think I think they view Jonah Williams as a better scheme fit. He's a little bit quicker of an athlete than a DJ Humphreys for that wide zone system. So Jonah's going to play right tackle. They're going to move Paris Johnson to left tackle. It, it's fine. You know, Jonah Williams, DJ Humphreys are kind of in the same tier of tackle for me. So if they view it as a better scheme fit and as an opportunity to get Paris Johnson to the left side of the line, where ultimately uh, I think that's where they wanted him to be. So it makes sense. I like their defensive tackle signings just to get some real players there. The Cardinals defensive line last year, especially on the inside, it was it was one of the worst position groups I've ever seen. Like, those were, it was a legit XFL squad. Like, the only guy that was adequate for them was a tweener sixth round rookie in, in uh, stills who shouldn't be starting. Like, let's just be honest. So they signed Justin Jones, who's a real NFL starting defensive tackle. Good player. They gave him like three years, 30 million, but they had to to get him in there. Uh, Bilal Nichols, a real NFL player. And then the guys that played last year can now become backups. So I, th- I think that is a an essential lift of the interior D-line. And then you put Hassan Reddick in there with all of the other complementary edge pieces. You could have a real D-line next year. So I'm expecting that to happen. Love that for Arizona. It had to happen. You expected it to happen. Uh, and then they also signed Sean Murphy Bunting. I'm a Sean Murphy Bunting fan, but last year was really disappointing in Tennessee. I'm not fully ready to give up on Sean Murphy bunting. I see a three-year, $25 million deal, and I'm, like, interested. One one thing I'm excited for Murphy bunting is this is the first time in his career that he'll be playing one of these off-zone sort of Fangio-style systems where it's it's a lot more quarters, flip your hips, snap down, down on, like, underneath stuff, and... He's Again, he's been more of a press man scheme fit over the years, but I'm curious if he low-key is actually a better zone off quarters type. So we'll see how that plays out. But if he's not good, I think they can get out of that pretty quickly. So I think that was a, that was a totally fine signing um, just to get some real NFL players on that defense. So I, I like what they've done, and I'm, I'm already just accounting for Hassan Reddick to be on the Cardinals because it just makes too much damn sense. All right. The... And, and that move may have already happened by the time this podcast is posted. Uh, the L.A. Rams, take note of what Sean McVay is doing. So a lot of the best coaches in the league 
are able to anticipate league trends and zig while the rest of the league zags. And Sean McVay knows, okay, the NFL is going towards nickel defenses, two shell coverages, lighter linebackers, lighter interior players. That's where the league is. So he has built this system where he now has Jonah Jackson, uh, Kevin Dotson, and Steve Avila, the biggest interior trio in the league. He has built this in a system where he can run 11 personnel to force you into nickel defense, yet two of his wide receivers can block like tight ends, Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. So they're going to stay in 11 personnel. They're going to force you into nickel where you've got light linebackers, you've, you're in a light package, yet they are going to smash the fuck out of you up the middle. And they went, they, this has been a wide zone type of offense. I'm so impressed by McVay because I've never really viewed McVay as like a run game genius, but at least the direction that he's just forcing this team to go where he's like, instead of wide zone, let's just spread these guys out or at least thin these guys out in terms of size and then smash them. And what's really fun is you have a the smallest running back in the league that's just going to get lost behind these guys. So he's going to get four yards, and then he could, I mean, man, to have that as a weapon, it's it, – take note of what Sean McVay is doing. He is being incredibly innovative, which is what the great coaches do. So I just – I love this. Um, and then, I mean, Colby Parkinson – that was a, a winning moment for for the channel because I've been waiting for Colby to get a payday. Now he's as of now he's still the tight end too. Will Disley is getting up there. Uh, not Will Disley. Um, uh, 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 the other tight end, Tyler Higby, <laughs> similar name. Uh, he, Colby goes from having Disley to Higby in front of him, but he is regressing, getting up there in age, getting more expensive. So I wouldn't be surprised if they just cut Higby. But Colby Parkinson, at least as another one of these, you know, he can play slot receiver for them and and block from that sort of wing, you know, flexed inside slot wing piece that Cooper Cup does a lot of. Colby's another weapon in that role, but I think he can play in line as well. So I'm just a huge fan of that signing. I, I would put him on your breakout candidates list at some point. He's been on mine for years. Uh, he still has Higby in his way for now, but we'll see if they keep it that way. And then the Darius Williams signing was so obvious. We talked about that in last podcast. I'm not even going to take credit for that. That's like when Hassan Reddick gets traded for the Cardinals. It's like it just everything lines up. That's so obvious. Uh, Darius Williams just coming home to the Rams. Fantastic. Three years, $22 million. Uh, you get him on a budget, on a discount, and uh, he's going to be a stud at, at corner for them. He's a really good player. So the Rams have had a fantastic offseason. They are building up their hype as if they needed more of it. Uh, then we got the San Francisco 49ers. Honestly, not a fan of what they've done. They haven't done much. They've really just shuffled up the defensive line. We knew they weren't going to be big spenders, but I didn't really see this coming. They released Eric Armstead to free up some cap space. I thought maybe presumably to use that money on Brandon Ayuk. No, they just take that money and dump it into a bunch of other players on the D-line. Now, I know they like D-line depth, and in their mind, three players is better than one, but... Is it really when those players are Yitor Gross Matos for $9 million a year, Leonard Floyd for $10 million a year, and Jordan Elliott for $5 million a year? That one especially makes no fucking sense. Just bring Kinlaw back at that point. Jordan Elliott, I am sorry, Jordan Elliott is trash. The Browns knew it. That's why they brought in all these other interior D linemen. Um, to, to even sign Jordan Elliott is questionable, let alone to give him five million a year over the next two years that one's like what what is the Niners scouting department looking at and Yitor Gross Matos he had a decent year for the Panthers in year four of his rookie contract after doing nothing nine million for him and then Leonard Floyd that one's fine um you know he had a bunch of sacks last year he's a cleanup artist I think scheming them up in this system, I think that's fine. But where's the trust in player development, too? Like, this team drafted um, the kid out of USC two years ago in the second round, uh, Drake Jackson. 
where's the trust in in him to develop? Even, I mean, Robert Beal was a decent fifth-round pick out of Georgia. Like, if the idea is the scheme's going to do the work, you just want a bunch of guys to fly around, why do you have to go out and pay these guys? I just, the, the Niners have a frustrating lack of player development at a lot of their position groups. So, I just do not agree with that direction for the Niners that do this every offseason. They do something that's like, well, yeah, I mean, they can get away with it because they have Kyle Shanahan and all these incredible players, but they just do this stuff where I'm like, what What the fuck is the thought process on that? I genuinely do not understand releasing Eric Armstead so that you can sign Etor Gross Matos, Leonard Floyd, and especially Jordan Elliott for that money. I don't get it. Um, they were also going to sign Eric Kendricks, but he pulled out and went to follow Mike Zimmer in Sam, in uh, in Dallas. So, you know, I don't think it's a huge loss, but they are they do need another linebacker because they uh, Greenlaw tore his Achilles in the in the Super Bowl. So I don't think he's going to be ready for next year. So I understood that, um, but keep an eye on them to still make a play. I wouldn't be surprised if they went for like a Devondre Campbell or something like that, but. Yeah, I mean, that's really all the Niners have done. I just I just don't get what they did with the D-line, man. I just don't. Like, if you got to release Armstead to clear up some cap for for Ayuk or something else, fine. But I, I will just say this. As a, as a Packers fan that is trying to beat the Niners, I couldn't be happier that that's the direction they decided to go. Seattle Seahawks have been fairly quiet. They were mostly focused on re-signing the players that, in my opinion, they should have been. Focused on, I mean, Leonard Williams, they had to get back. He played well for them. Second round pick. Letting him go would have really hurt to just lose that second round pick. So they do get him back. Three years, $45 million. I'm fine with it. And then I really like getting Noah Fant back because I think Noah Fant can play. I think, you know, early in Denver, he was still learning the position and they didn't really have quarterback play. I think he's ready to be a starting tight end, and I think Seattle feels that way too. They released Will Disley. They didn't resign Colby Parkinson. They brought Noah Fant at over $10 million a year, and he's on my breakout list for next year. He's He could he could really thrive. You know, I was mocking them Brock Bowers uh, because uh, I, I didn't think they were going to get Fant back, but uh, they did, and there's a reason I think that's a good opportunity there. So I, I'm happy that that's kind of where they shifted their their direction. They did make some sneaky signings I liked. Rayshon Jenkins, two for $12 million in the Kyle Hamilton role. Rayshon Jenkins is a big, lengthy safety that's had his deficiencies. But I think uh, as a, as a re- refill of Jamal Adams, I can't even say a replacement uh, necessarily because Adams didn't really give them anything. But in that role, in this di- system with McDonald coming over, makes a ton of sense. I like George Fant as a signing to bring him home where he started his career. Really good tackle depth. He played a lot of snaps for Houston last year and was really good. So if they have question marks about health at right tackle, uh, George Fant can fill in so seamlessly. And then Nick Harris is a sneaky good signing for, for Seattle. So Nick Harris was supposed to be the Cleveland Browns starting center, I think, two years ago. And after that was after J.C. Treader retired. They had Nick Harris ready to go, but he he tore his ACL, I think, in preseason. And then former Seahawks center Nick Pochich um, or Nathan Pochich stepped in. I don't think I'm getting that first right first name right, but Pochich stepped in and won that starting job. So Nick Harris all of a sudden was out of a job in Cleveland. But I love that as a value signing for a guy that had won a starting job but just didn't get a chance to really show what he can do. I think it's a really good sneaky signing for a team that needed a center. So uh, good signing at Nick Harris. I am curious who the hell is playing at linebacker for them. I'm very happy that they didn't overpay on Patrick Queen like we talked about in the last podcast. I think that was good restraint by them to say, we can find something else at linebacker there, but they're going to need something because Bobby Wagner, Jordan Brooks are out the door. So we'll see what they do there. Wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, bringing Devin Bush back. Not a huge fan of that, but Michigan connection there. Um, but yeah, I think Seattle's had a nice tempered off season. Getting those guys back was huge. It was necessary. Um, 
So the Atlanta Falcons up next as we go to the NFC South. I it would be a lot easier if I just deferred you to the last 10 minutes of my live stream on YouTube. It'd be very easy to find. It was the very last segment that we talked about. Just go to the end, like 10 minutes left. We talked about Kirk in Atlanta for like 10 minutes. So if you really want to hear about it, go check that out. Um, but Spark Notes version, love the signing. You go with a defensive head coach, a win-now window. You get Zach Robinson, who's going to run the exact same offense that Kirk has been running under uh, Kevin O'Connell. It'll be an easy easy plug and play for Kirk. A lot of weapons. Love Darnell Mooney on top of that. We might as well mention that because you've got, you know, Drake, I, I would say they have a lot of short to intermediate guys that will dominate. Kyle Pitts and London can can stretch the field in terms of like, go get it down, deep down the field. But Mooney can like legit, space things out, take the top off. Perfect fit. I think Mooney was done dirty by Justin Fields never looking his way in Chicago. You know, I, I said it on the live stream that, uh, or maybe it was a different video. It, it might have been the the free agent video uh, a week ago, but I just, I can't imagine a more miserable job in the league than being the number two wide receiver for Justin Fields because he's just not going to look at you. So I think Mooney can get right back to you know, I, I was comparing him to Brandon Cooks a couple years ago. I think he'd get right back to that in this offense. So I think it's a great signing. People saying it was an overpay. Uh, I think Justin Fields is just overrated. So uh, a big fan of that. But, yeah, with Kirk, I, I want to finish that thought about the system. Not only, not only is the scheme going to help Kirk step in and play right away, but Zach Robinson's a young guy, first-time play caller. Having Kirk there almost as a mentor to Zach Robinson is useful for Zach Robinson to do a good job as the offensive coordinator. So it's just good vibes with the offense. I even like the Charlie Warner signing as another blocking tight end so that Kyle Pitts can focus on being that wing player. Uh, three years, 12 million for him makes sense. And now it's like they're going in for this window to try to win in the NFC South for as long as it's dog shit. And, you know, that's about a two year window, I think. And then they, I think, are not done. I think they now that they have they have secured this offense, it really is good to go. Their offensive line is, yeah, they got their old line is in shape. They've got receivers, tight ends, running backs, quarterback. Nothing really left to do offensively. So now you look at really the rest of this free agency and then the draft to focus on the defense. They still need a second corner. They need a second safety. They need edge, which I think is a lock to be that eighth overall pick. I think they could use one more piece on the interior as well. Uh, but I did have Justin Simmons. I will say this. I had Justin Simmons as a ideal fit here. Look out for it, man. That would be so fun if Justin Simmons landed in Atlanta to pair with Jesse Bates. The hype for this team. Like that is that is the type of move that I think could really inch them closer from, yeah, their favorites in the NFC South. I think that much is clear. If they sign Justin Simmons, I think that's a move that would inch them closer towards like, damn, this could really be a Super Bowl team from the NFC. So we'll see where they go. And then Tampa Bay, it was very, this was kind of what we expected from them just to kind of try to run it back, keep trying to squeeze Tom Brady's team's window out with Baker Mayfield. That's really what we're seeing. Like even the one external signing they made was someone that was on the Brady teams, and that was Jordan Whitehead. Now, I like that. Two years, cheaper deal for Jordan Whitehead. Fills a huge need for them. So I, I like that, either as a slot corner or as a strong safety. He could do either for them. But, um, you know, they bring Baker back on the deal we expected, the, the Geno Smith deal. That's fine. You know, I'm, I'm not, like, super excited about it, but you had to do it, you know. That's really all my thoughts on it. Um, Mike Evans comes back. It's great. I think that definitely had to happen if you were going to extend Baker because I really I'm already not that excited about Baker keeping this up um, and paying back that contract. Um, like, do I like honestly? Do I really think there's a huge difference between Baker Mayfield and Jacoby Brissett signing in New England? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Um, so if if he's going to pay the value back from a production standpoint, you had to get Evans back. And he's just lifetime buck. The fans are obsessed with him. You got to bring him back. And then Levante David decides to come back too. So that's, you know, they're they're trying to still squeeze this thing out. 
but they lost a couple pieces still. You know, Carlton Davis gets traded away for a third-round pick. Shaq Barrett's gone. So the edge group, the cornerback room is really thinning out. It's fine. I don't have any complaints about their offseason, but I'm just going to say I'm, I, I will be betting against the Bucks next year. I just, you know, Dave Canales leaves. I think I do think the Panthers will be better. We'll talk about them. But not even so much that. Like, I think Atlanta's going to win this division. I think the Saints will still be competitive. And for Tampa, it's like, okay, maybe you finish second. Maybe you finish first in this division. But even then, it's like, then what, right? Like, they barely scraped out the most garbage division in football last year with a really easy schedule. So I'm just, I'm going to try not to be too negative about the Bucks. But anytime you have a team that made the playoffs that I don't think is going to do it again, you know, it's, I'm going to have to come off as a hater, but I'm just being honest. So let's move on to the Carolina Panthers that I think have had up there for the best off season. And, you know, we were really skeptical about David Tepper being too involved here and, you know, everything that happened last year and this being a place that players don't want to be at. And, um, you know, the, they, they, they got a lot of flack for hiring an internal general manager when their front office has been such a train wreck. But I'm going to be honest, man, I don't know that the Panthers could have done anything better than what they've done so far. Just a massive round of applause. Just the overall strategy for saying, look, w- just like the Titans have done, we have got to find out if Bryce Young is a bust or if we really just fucked him last year. And I think they're right to say, like, I think we fucked them last year, so let's give them everything we can possibly give them. And they're not even done yet, but I I love kind of converting defensive assets into offensive pieces. Obviously, the Brian Burns trade, it it, it created cap space, plus you're also converting a defensive player in, in Dante Jackson. So you're creating cap space from a defensive player and Dante Jackson, Combining that to allocate that to Deontay Johnson, who I think is the perfect fit for this offense, they needed a quick early separator that just can, like, when you're a young quarterback and you went through what what Bryce went through last year, it is such a relief to have a guy that you know is going to be open. And, okay, so he might have some drops. It might lead to some, you know, three and outs and some frustration moments. But in terms of Bryce seeing the field and developing and, and showing that he isn't a bust, Deontay is exactly what they need. Um, and then you're obviously spending all this money on guard. I I cannot explain how bad their guard play was last year. It is it is probably the worst guard play I've ever seen. I I, t- I tweeted a screenshot of it. They had nine they had like nine guards play last year, and they all had PFF grades in like below forty. Like, 60 is replacement-level play. 40 is horrible. Most of their key guys getting playing time were below 10. Like, they literally might as well not have been on the field. They might as well have been doing that gun monster formation where it's, you know, they were lining up Bozeman, Moten, and Icky and just flexing out Ian Thomas and and Tommy Tremble out as like wing blockers for potential screens on the outside. Like they might as well not have had fucking guards last year. So now you spend $156 million at guard on Robert Hunt, who's a star guard, one of the highest paid players in free agency last year. Obviously they, it looked like an overpay because hundred million dollars for a guard is pretty crazy. But in this market, that's what guys are getting right. Like um, Landon Dickerson, just signed for $21 million a year in Philadelphia. No one said a peep, right? It was like, oh, yeah, Landon Dickerson's really good. I think Robert Hunt is is almost an identical player, honestly, to Landon Dickerson, a big, thumping, six foot six guard who's a, really good in, as as both a run blocker and a pass blocker. Um, You know, Robert Hunt gets five years, $100 million, whereas Dickerson got four years, 84. So, like, I'm totally cool with that signing. I don't think it's an overpay based on the market. Because it's not like Lander Dickerson was a free agent, right? Like that was an internal signing for twenty million dollars. So there you have it. It's not a not an overpay. Uh, you know, Damian Lewis is not a great pass protector, 
really good run blocker, but he's fine as a pass protector, better than what they had last year. And there's an added benefit to him being a six foot two player because that's at least one of those offensive linemen that Bryce is going to have a clear, uh, clear line of sight over. And then Austin Corbett, it sounds like is going to, who wasn't fully healthy last year, he tore his ACL late in the 2022 season, so he gets back fully healthy. You put him at center. And then I like their tackles. Taylor Moten and Iki Aquanu, I think, was just surrounded by a disaster last year. Was good in his rookie year. New coaching. I think Iki will be just fine. So, like, the offensive line upgrades, I think, could very well be the biggest, the, the most improved position group in the entire league next year. Especially with Dave Canales, whose system is, is going to be a lot more play action and, you know, just helping these guys up front, too, with schemes. So... I love what they've done. And then now you have you have the 33rd pick and the 39th pick and the first pick in the third round in a really amazing wide receiver cl- class to go get at least another piece. So if you're talking about, like, I wouldn't be stunned if they take that 33rd pick and try to move up to, like, the 25th pick and get either Xavier Worthy or Adonai Mitchell uh, or if it's that 33rd pick, I would love like a Xavier Leggett here or even like a Ricky Pearsall, I think, can be more of a vertical player. Or, you know, I, my comp for Lad McConkey was Deontay Johnson, so I don't know that they do that. Uh, but it is funny that I was always mocking Lad McConkey with that 33rd pick for the exact same reasons that we talked about why Deontay Johnson is such a good fit here. So, I mean, that's all exciting. And then quietly, um, We've all been saying, or at least people on Twitter have been like, okay, but what about the defense? First of all, to my point that I've said a couple times, whatever happens on defense for the Panthers this year does not matter. It's all about Bryce and the offense and getting things right there. You can worry about the defense later because eventually if Bryce hits, you have a quarterback that is going to elevate things. But look, the Panthers have quietly filled out that defense decently well. So they signed Josie Jewell to a very good competitive, you know, three-year, 20-something million dollar contract. Look, Josie Jewell's a, a, a nice player. He's a good starting linebacker who, you know, if if you're going to go with Ajero Evero and give him a motley crew of cheap pieces on the defense and just trust that Ajero Evero is one of your team's best assets, which he is. It's why he didn't, it's why they didn't let him interview. They were like, I'm sorry, Evero. Please just bear with us. I know you want to leave, but like we can't let you leave. We need you. We need you to elevate this defense, and he can. He's a great defensive coordinator. Look at what he did with Denver's defense a year ago when they had a bunch of bad pieces. But Josie Jewell, as the captain, the green dot, and a extension of Ajero Evero's mind, because Jewell has played well in Evero's system in Denver before. So that was like the perfect little get for that linebacker room. They signed Ashawn Robinson, who's a workable defensive tackle. You now have Derek Brown, Ashawn Robinson. You have Shai Tuttle, who they paid last year. Unless they cut Shai Tuttle, but if they did, whatever. He's cuttable. Um, but, I mean, Derek Brown's a beast. Edge is going to be a need. There's no denying that. Um, but then they add Dane Jackson in the secondary. They also extended uh, Troy Hill, who's a NFL player. Played well for them last year in this defense. So you have Dane Jackson, who I think can start for them. He's a capable player who's started a lot of games for Buffalo. He's one of those guys that, like, will he get get beat? Yes. Is he the most physically gifted corner ever? No. But he's super smart. He's tough. He's got inside-out flexibility. If he's playing, you're mostly not going to worry about him. So you got those two guys. Um, and, and you know, safety is a, is a position they'll have to address as well. But... <laughs> And even then, they still have Xavier Woods. So they still have a player back there. They drafted Jamie Robinson last year who can play a little bit. So I think with Averro, you're expecting at least somewhat capable defensive play. And I think they'll be able to draft some guys, right? It's not like they're going to use those three top 73 picks all on wide receiver. I think they really realistically only need to spend one on wide receiver, but they might also spend one of those on like a Jatavion Sanders, uh, a tight end out of Texas or something like that. So a lot of time on Carolina there. I I got so excited about the Deontay Johnson trade that I changed my Twitter handle to Marcus Whitman, Closet Panthers fan. And uh, I didn't realize there's a review period on Twitter now. So you're going to see my name as um, 
Panthers fan for a while now until I'm able to change it back. Uh, but that's how excited I got about the Panthers. And, uh, you know, I think I, I'm not expecting them to like win a bunch of games next year or anything, but I just, I just want Bryce to be good, man. Not even so much for my draft takes. It's more just like, I think he's such a good dude. I think he's a really good quarterback that got so fucked last year. And like CJ Stroud being a better quarterback and being the guy that the Panthers probably should have drafted, that shouldn't turn into Bryce Young hate, in my opinion. Like, can't the, these guys both be good? Like, especially the NFC. Like, the NFC needs good young quarterbacks. We need, we need Bryce to be good. So I'm excited for them. Uh, let's move on to the Dallas, uh, sorry, the New Orleans Saints. Really nothing to say there. This feels like the first year where they're really feeling it. You know, they've been kicking the can down the road so, so much. Um, really, the only thing they've done is restructure contracts and signed Willie Gay, which I am excited to see Willie Gay in Dennis Allen's defense, where every linebacker that plays for Dennis Allen seems to be a stud. Now, he's going to be kind of right back in that role he had in Kansas City, where he's not a starter because they have Ellis and they have um, or no, Ellis left. Ellis is in in uh, Atlanta. So they have Pete Werner and Demario Davis. So they still don't have a clear opportunity for Willie Gay. But as that, that third linebacker that the, the Saints like to bring in, and as a backup, you know, he's, he's their type. He can blitz, cover. He does a lot of different stuff. Great athlete, good size. So it's a sneaky little signing to get some really good linebacker depth and a guy that will play a little bit on early downs for him. Okay, Dallas Cowboys, we are at, I'm just checking, okay, we're hour 42 in, we're doing good. Uh, Dallas Cowboys um, are getting a lot of crap because they, like the Saints, haven't really done anything. Now, I do like the Eric Hendricks signing because Eric Hendricks with Mike Zimmer was a really nice duo. Now, Kendricks isn't the athlete that he once was, but... I mean, if, you, if you're talking about bringing in a new defense, that system's going to look a little different than what Dan Quinn was doing. But if you need a leader of that defense that can be an on-the-field coach and really smooth this transition, not to mention linebackers, a huge need for Dallas. We talked about the one signing them making being Levante David, potentially. This is the similar style, where it's a veteran guy. You kind of know what you're getting. So I like that as a signing, but... You know, they're getting some crap because I, I think Skip Bayless was on first take and was like, all in my ass, which is a great quote. <laughs> Need to emphasize the break between all in and my ass on that one, Skip. But <laughs> the, the one thing with Dallas that people got to realize is within the next year, they have C.D. Lamb, Micah Parsons, and Dak Prescott up for contract extensions. Dak is probably going to ask for $60 million. C.D. Lamb is going to reset the wide receiver market at like 35. He's going to get whatever Justin Jefferson gets, which is going to be stupid money. And then um, Micah Parsons is probably going to reset the edge market and get like, I've, I've heard, I think it might have been Brad Spiel, Spielberger suggest, Micah Parsons might get $40 million. And I don't think it's absurd with how the cap is rising. So that could legitimately be half the team's salary cap on average, I mean, they'll 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 redistribute and make sure all those hits aren't you know piling up in the same year. But you can't fully redistribute all that money. Like that's potentially going to be half of the team's salary cap tied up on those three players. So they can't really come out the gate and be aggressive here. So I get it, and I I think they will eventually try to fill some holes with some you know bargain bin signings, but. I'm not going to really slam Dallas for not being aggressive here because I just think they have to be a little bit conscious of those contracts coming down the coming down the uh, the pipe here. Philadelphia signed Saquon Barkley. Love it. I I, I think it's you know the, the the don't pay running backs thing went so far in one direction that you know I think. I think you can pay really good running backs now, and I think we've seen that like elite running backs do enough to really elevate running games. And with Saquon Barkley, three years, thirty nine, uh, yeah, three years, thirty nine million. So, what's what you have to consider too is was while everybody's been hating on running backs, 
for like the last five years. Like you go back six, seven years ago, I think it was like like Dalvin Cook, Henry, uh, Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, like a wave of contracts came in that were like about 15, 16 million a year was like top dollar for running backs. So since then, the cap has gone up like a hundred million dollars. Yet the what you have to pay the best running backs in the league has gone down about three million a year. So the top running backs go from making, I don't know, 10% of your cap to 5%. <laughs> so just from a raw value perspective, it's changed that. And people don't talk enough about that. But also, we've seen the growth of the run game. Like, you know, we've talked about Sean, Sean McVay going towards the run game. Teams are getting lighter. And the run game is, and, and playing more too high coverage, the run game is making a resurgence. So I think for Philadelphia, who has, for a while, been on the train of, okay, running back is a, a, a position where there's not a lot of value, they might be looking at this. And saying, actually, Saquon million, uh, Saquon Barkley at thirteen million is actually a value that is a market deficiency. That is what Philadelphia is all about: is finding market deficiencies. And this is an impact player for their offense. This isn't just another running back, right? Like this is a guy that this is the same reason I was suggesting maybe Bijan Robinson for them in the draft last year because when you have this system with Jalen Hurts and the, the amount of read options they run. Now, their O-line isn't quite what it was with Kelsey, but they're hoping that Juergens, and they made another sneaky signing here, Matt Hennessy, it's been a really good run blocker for the Falcons as an undersized athletic guy. You know, between him and Juergens, they can get, uh, I can't say 80% of Kelsey, because what does that even mean? But comparable style of play i'll just leave it at that they're they're losing kelsey it's a loss i don't think the run blocking is going to be quite what it was but the system hopefully jalen hurts gets healthy the threat of that will create these wide open lanes for saquon that he's gonna look he's gonna get his first carry in philadelphia and be like what the fuck dude where has this been in my entire career this is amazing and with his speed his home run hitting ability you're you're talking about I mean, we saw a little bit of it with Swift last year, but Saquon's just a much better version of sub DeAndre Swift and brings a much better power element so that, like, obviously not every single carry are going to be gaping holes. You still are eventually going to have to make a cut and have good vision, and I think Saquon has much better vision than DeAndre Swift. So it's a it's a fantastic signing. I am curious if they're going to throw him the ball a lot more because – that was something they didn't get the most out of DeAndre Swift. And just, you know, Jalen Hurts isn't the biggest check down guy. Like, usually he's going to scramble instead of using the check down. But can they get Saquon involved as a slot receiver and do some more creative stuff to throw him the ball? I would love to see that because he's just so dynamic. But it's a really fun signing, let alone the interdivision stuff. So I'm, I'm a fan of that. And then we mentioned this earlier, but with them signing Bryce Huff, and I love Bryce Huff, I think he can – replace Hassan Reddick's production. Um, but this has to mean a, a Reddick trade for me because they've they've talked about maybe trading Sweat or Reddick has been the rumor. And for me, it's like, well, you can't have three designated pass rushers. <laughs> like Nolan Smith, Hassan Reddick, and Bryce Huff. I know you like depth, and that's kind of your type of player, but you can't have three of those guys. Like when they drafted Nolan Smith... It was already like, how are they going to really get him on the field? And they didn't year one. So, you know, I think the Reddick's trade, Reddick trade is going to happen. I think it's the right thing to do to redistribute some of those resources. I think Bryce Huff can refill that production and allow you to get a little bit younger, a little bit cheaper, whereas Reddick's probably going to get about $22, 23000000 million from Arizona. Right now, he's getting about fifteen. So... I do expect a Reddick trade to be like I've been recording for two hours. Has it happened yet? I wouldn't be surprised. I'm just gonna type in. Um has not happened yet, but it's it's gonna happen, guys. It is. 
And then what else did they do? Oh, Chauncey Gardner Johnson. It, it had to happen, right? I think, you know, their their secondary is so grim. The Kevin Byard thing didn't work out. Uh, and Gardner Johnson makes a ton of sense for a variety of reasons. They released Avante Maddox, so they have an opening at slot corner, where in my opinion, Chauncey, I know he had a bunch of picks when he played in Philly. Picks are a weird stat, right? Like there's a re- reason Geno Stone, who led the league in picks for safeties, only got $7 million a year for two years. It's just a fluky stat for safeties. It just is. Um, and he's fine at safety, but I actually think Chauncey Gardner-Johnson is best as a slot corner. So I wouldn't be stunned if he's playing that sort of big slot in this Fangio defense. And I think that would actually be his best position at three years, 33. But he can play safety as well. So decent signing. You bring him back. He was a good fit there. And he brings a little bit more of that energy and confidence back to the locker room that I think they were missing last year. So I think it's a, it's a totally fine signing. That's about the max of what I would pay Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, uh, but it's fine. And then I mentioned Matt Hennessy being a sneaky little signing. So I, I really like what the Eagles have done. And if they can get a third-round pick back for Hassan Reddick, why not, right? So good offseason. New York Giants, also very good offseason. I think they've had... You know, the Giants are in this weird state, right, where, like, okay, they were in the playoffs last year, their quarterback got hurt, Yesterday, yeah, last year was weird, but they kind of like some of the stuff they're building. And um, I think they just had a very measured offseason where they didn't do anything that's going to, like, set them back if it doesn't work out. Like, it wasn't, like, massive free agent signings that they won't be able to get out of. Um, they make the one big move for a guy that they know is going to work out, and that's Brian Burns who they had to kind of pry away from Carolina. Expensive price to pay, right? Like $27, $28 million. It's a lot of money. Um, but Brian Burns is a great player. And they give the second-round pick, but I think that was a good move, right? It, it does exactly what I was looking for them to do when I was talking about them signing Christian Wilkins. Make that D-line an identity of your team. And I just think once you have something that you have a go-to piece of your team – we use the term build around, but that's what we're talking about. Get something that is your bread and butter that you do well, that you're forcing teams to account for, and then you can get into your counter punches and stacking complementary pieces on top of that. You give me Dexter Lawrence, maybe the best defensive tackle in football right now. Seriously. Um, you know, Brian Burns, I think for Kayvon Thibodeau, year three, this is this is huge because Brian Burns is a great mentor for Tibbs from a a mentorship standpoint in terms of teaching him pass rush moves and stuff. Burns was, like Thibodeau, a very raw, toolsy player coming in. So Burns can kind of be like, yeah, I used to try that, but then I learned in the NFL it doesn't work. I had to, you know, dip my shoulder or or get to this move. Like, I think from that point of view, it's great. But also, Burns is a a super mature, high-character guy that you're putting in that locker room. Look, I, I will admit, I called the Kayvon Thibodeau immaturity concerns bullshit in the draft. I was a big Tibbs guy. I think his immaturity stuff has surfaced in the NFL. He has not turned into the player I thought he would be. He's been fine. Um, but I think getting Brian Burns in there with Tibbs, and not to mention the fact that it makes Tibbs your number three, it, it could lead to a big boom for the number the former number six overall pick or number five pick, whatever he was. So excited for Tibbs this year. Um, and even, you know, now Aziz, uh, Aziz um, uh, Ashalari, if he can stay healthy, uh, you know, he, you put him in a role where you just you put him out there on some third downs, let him do some stuff, and hopefully a reduced snap count, he can stay healthy and be more of a piece for you. So I, I like that D-line quite a lot. Um, and then they did some other sneaky good stuff, right? Like they knew they had to do some stuff on the offensive line, and I think the moves they made were really good. Um, number one, they, they brought in Carmen Brasillo, which if, if, if Bill Callahan isn't the best offensive line coach in the league, it's Carmen Brasillo. And dude, I love this so much because I'm going to go on a mini tangent here for those that watch studs and duds. Um, last year they signed Tyree Phillips from Baltimore and he's still a free agent. I wouldn't mind bringing Tyree Phillips back, too, just to have more pieces in here. But Tyree Phillips started to play well at right tackle last year. And 
I was like, wow, this reminds me a lot of Jermaine Illuminor, who Baltimore drafted, ended up somewhere else, and then turned into a really quality starting tackle under Carmen Brasillo in Las Vegas. Um, started to show that in New England before that. But, you know, the hope was maybe Tyree Phillips could be Jermaine Illuminor. Well, why eliminate or why not eliminate that risk and just fucking sign Jermaine Illuminor, who gets to reunite with his old line coach? Like, no brainer. And it gives you flexibility where, look, Runyon can play left guard, right guard. If you like what you see from Neal, Evan Neal, your former first round pick, he's your right tackle. Illuminor can play guard. You put Runyon at left guard. Or, you know, if Evan Neal is just a bust and his foot speed is that bad and he's too play to, uh, too tall to play guard, you swallow your pride and you just start Jermaine Illuminor at right tackle. So I, I think that was a brilliant signing. John Runyon, three years, 30 million, is is totally fine for me because he's a he's a very refined pass protector. For the Giants, you're never going to have to worry about John Runyon, really. Um, he's just a really bad run blocker, and that's why he's not getting the Robert Hunt contract and some of these other big deals. He just doesn't have really play strength, but he moves so well as a pass protector, and he's got that left side, right side versatility. You're not going to regret this signing, I don't think. Um, he's much, and and he's much more proven than I think Mark Lewinsky was coming out of Indianapolis, where it was kind of a one-year wonder breakout year, and he was uh, Glowinski was never as good of a pass protector as John Runyon. So I think you're getting exactly what you need with those signings without breaking the bank. And then you sign Isaiah McKenzie. Why not? I mean, I know you already have Wandell Robinson, but he, he's a guy that's had a hard time staying healthy. So if Wandale's not available, Isaiah McKenzie reunites with Brian Dayball. You get some juice in that wide receiver room. I like that as a signing. Um, and then Devin Singletary, three years, $16 million, makes a lot of sense as well. Reunited with Brian Dayball. So uh, as, a, as a replacement for Saquon. I mean, Singletary is just a really underrated player. Was really happy to see him continue to produce in Houston after a slow start last year. So I think that's a, that's a good deal. He's a good back. I would want Singletary in fantasy. I think he's going to get a lot of touches there. So uh, happy for him. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a good signing for the Giants. And I think this puts them in a spot where they can be flexible in the draft. You know, if, if they can move up, I still think they're a, you know, this is a team that I think ideally I would still be able to put Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors in with this group of receivers. Um, but. In this draft class, you kept your other second-round pick in the Burns trade. In this draft class, if they went a move to go up and get a Jane Daniels at three, or if they fall to him at six, this, I think, is a much more breathable situation for a young quarterback. And they could sit for a year behind uh, Daniel Jones. So I'm much more on board with them going quarterback. Or, dude, honestly, you put Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors on this team, I think this is a team that you can start to win some games with with Daniel Jones, honestly. And you know, I Daniel Jones was was fine a year ago, right? Like I'm not saying he's the future or anything, but I think they have options. It was a good offseason for the Giants. Okay, for Washington, they've been very busy. Uh, just filling out the roster with a million value deals. It had to happen. Their roster was a complete shit show, the offensive line and the defense as a whole, and we've seen them spend an a bunch of money here. And, you know, it was going to end up being a lot of money because if you're making this many signings in the first wave of free agency, inevitably you're going to end up paying these guys a little bit more than you want to. But I will say for the new front office and the new regime, none of these deals are things that I'm like, whoa, they gave like, that, you're going to pay him that much money. Like, what are you doing? Right? Like, I think most of these are about what you would have had to pay these players if you were keeping them in-house, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, the one big piece they really spent on was Dorrance Armstrong, and they desperately needed an edge rusher. I, I would have preferred that this was going out for, you know, someone's a little bit more proven as a starter, someone like a Jonathan Grennard or something like that. But he is fascinating because Dorrance Armstrong was a – a kind of boom or bust draft and develop prospect coming out of Kansas. They took him in the mid rounds and he's obviously been a part of a massively deep rotation in Dallas. 
and he has bulked up. He's uh, bulked up. He's become a great run defender, but he's been an efficient pass rusher as well. So this does remind me a lot of Trey Hendrickson when he signed with Cincinnati, and it's even less. I'm curious what Dorrance Armstrong can do as a starter, and obviously Dan Quinn believes in him. So I'm, I kind of am cautiously optimistic about that signing. And it, it was first reported as three years, $45 million, which is exactly what Trey Hendrickson got. But it's actually three years, 33, worth up to 45 million with incentives. So I actually, that signing has actually really grown on me. I'm excited to see Dorrance Armstrong. I think he could be at least a good number two. And if that's at 12, 13 million dollars, that's that's a good signing. They signed linebackers galore here. So they signed uh, Bobby Wagner just for some stability, some leadership. Sure. I like bringing Bobby Wagner in, reuniting him with Dan Quinn. That's a fun signing. Um, they signed Frankie Louvu who's a, a movable chess piece for, for Dan Quinn. I think he can do a lot of pass rushing stuff as well. Some of the Micah Parsons stuff, right? Like he's a, he's a hybrid linebacker. It's a fun signing. And then honestly for them, I think Jeremy Chin is a linebacker, um, at least in the J Ron curse role. Um, you know, Jeremy Chin is built like a linebacker. He's like 220 pounds. They have a lot of bodies back there. I know cam curl is, is sitting out there, but um, Washington has some players I like, honestly, as a safety. They have um, uh, Derek Forrest, one of my my guys, had a great year last year. They have um, Quan Martin, still listed as a nickel corner for them, but I like him as a safety in that system. And Percy Butler played okay back there. So for me, Jeremy Chin is the J. Ron Kirsch role, right? He's the Marquise Bell role. He's a safety linebacker hybrid. He's going to play a lot in the box, and I love that role for him. So I'm excited for Jeremy Chin. I mean, honestly, that trio of linebackers plus another guy that they already have who played pretty well last year in Jamin Davis, that middle of the field is an asset for them. And then offensively, you knew they had to spend some money. Nick Allegretti, Tyler Biadash on the offensive line. I like that. High-character veterans. Nick Allegretti gets an opportunity to start. I'm really happy for him there. Uh, I think he can he can be a decent ta- uh, guard for them. They do still need a left tackle, so I am curious with all these Dallas guys following them over. I am one. I am curious if this is a sneaky Tyron Smith team here. I wouldn't be stunned if they kind of made a splash there to get uh, a high end left tackle for Drake May. Um, and then another guy is uh, uh, Humphreys just became available too, so I could see that um, some connection there with Cliff Kingsbury and DJ Humphrey. So I think one of those two guys would make a lot of sense. All of these signings have been like nepotism signings uh, where it's, there's a familiar face. Um, they brought, I forgot to mention, by the way, they added even more pieces on the edge. They added uh Clayland Farrell and Dante Fowler as third, fourth pieces. I'm fine with that. Um, would love if they can take that second round pick and turn that into either a chop Robinson uh, or a a Caden Ellis. Like, if they could get one of those two edge guys, would love that. Or shit, if, like, Latu or Verse start to fall, I'd move up and get another good edge in this piece. Um, so that that's fun. Uh, kind of a deeper D-line all of a sudden. And then they bring in Austin Eckler, two years, $8.5 Why the hell not, right? Like, him and Brian Robinson, perfectly reasonable running back duo, right? You got your thumper, you got receiving back. Great, love it. And then they bring Jamison Crowder back to fill in the slot position because Curry Samuel is leaving. Um, I actually kind of like that for Crowder. I still think Crowder can play. He just hasn't really gotten an opportunity. Um, he signed in some deep rooms, so I kind of like him coming back. Why not? And then they signed Marcus Mariota as a backup quarterback. Whatever. I, I actually don't fully understand why you signed Marcus Mariota, if I'm being honest. But one year, six million, whatever. I, I will say a lot of people thought that that – meant that they're going to draft Jaden Daniels because Marcus Mariota once upon a time ran a four or five. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, number one, Mark, uh, Marcus Mariota is much closer to Drake May as a player uh, than Jaden Daniels, in my opinion. But I mean, he's going to be their third string quarterback at the end of the day. Like I, I think unless you're trading Sam Howell, I, again, I just don't really understand the Marcus Mariota signing. Like why spend the money, you know, save that as rollover cap for, Uh, spending money for your rookie quarterback when he hits. But I I do like what Washington did, honestly. It's nothing like 
super flashy, but it's a bunch of guys that make sense, and they're going to be competitive, I think, with with their young quarterback that I will continue to reiterate. I think is Drake May. I just I, I really have a hard time seeing an NFL team watch the film and going with Daniels over over May. But we got one more division here. Are we under two hours? No, we are not under two hours, which was to be expected, but we knew this was going to be a megalodon. All right, Minnesota Vikings making some moves here. They let Kirk go, which I think unless you had expectations that you were winning a Super Bowl with Kirk Cousins this year, which was possible, but like 5%, right? Like you were still going to be the fifth or sixth best team at best in the NFC. Um, I think if you're a Vikings fan, it's a breath of fresh air to at least know that you're finally looking for a young quarterback. And I think Minnesota trading up in the draft is something we're going to have to spend a lot of time talking about in mock drafts and stuff. I'm going to save that for a different day. But I do like the Sam Darnold signing. Um, it, it, almost as much in a way of like, honestly, if they don't fall in love with any of these quarterbacks, I'm okay with just saying, you know what? Let's roll the dice with Sam Darnold. And I know I've been a Sam Dar- Darnold defender. I just think he is a quarterback that has been put into garbage situations, very similar to his his draft mate, Baker Mayfield. Now, Baker's shown higher end play than Darnold, but look, the Jets were the Jets. The Panthers were the Panthers. <laughs> and when he went to San Francisco last year, when we got to see him play, I mean, he ran Trey Lance out of town. That counts for something, right? Um when we got to see him play last year, he he was throwing heaters, man. He looked good. So you put him in a similar style offense in Minnesota with Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, franchise tackles, great play caller, TJ Hawkinson, Aaron Jones. Like, he he's still pretty young, Sam Darnold. He's, what, 26? <laughs> I, I know I've done this before. He's 26 years old. He's a year older than Jaden Daniels. <laughs> like, that's freaking crazy. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm very interested in the concept of Sam Darnold being this year's that we've seen it back to back years. Geno Smith, we laughed. Baker Mayfield, we laughed. Those guys got big contracts and filled that team's position. So I like the signing. Um, and it also provides flexibility, of course, to Go get a J.J. McCarthy. If Darnold is just kind of a decent player, ideally, you know, he makes it through the year, you let him go, you you start J.J. McCarthy. I think that's a good opportunity for him. Um, Maybe Michael Penix in the second round, right? It just, it opens the door for whatever they got to do at quarterback. And if Darnold just sucks and you don't draft a guy, maybe get a top pick next year, right? I just, I'm very cautiously optimistic about that signing, and it's probably going to bite me in the ass, but... This is the last time. If Darnold can't be successful here, I am done saying that I won't quit Sam Darnold. I will quit Sam Darnold if he can't succeed here because I do think this is one of the most QB-friendly opportunities in the league. Um, Love getting Aaron Jones. You know, I I will talk. Let's actually, let's let's do Aaron Jones last as a transition into Green Bay in this division because that's that's an easy way to do that. Um, But they did some stuff on the defense, too. So, in my opinion, I'm actually cool with what they did. I I know some people were critical of them letting Daniil Hunter go just to pay Jonathan Grenard, but Grenard comes less AAV and more cap flexibility. Daniil Hunter was fully guaranteed, right? Like, that is your cap hit, unless you're putting void years on it, but that is your cap hit for that year. Grenard and Van Ginkle, you're much more able to... You know, Grenard especially going to be able to move the cap around, restructure, push stuff into the future, that kind of stuff. So really what this was, was you get Jonathan Grenard plus Andrew Van Ginkle, who are younger in, in, this, in this team, where they might be looking at this as like, okay, we're in transition season, right? Which they probably are. They just signed Sam Darnold as their starting quarterback. So it's like, look, paying Daniel Hunter is great, but... Is he going to be there in two years? Like, is he going to be part of this team in two years? I, I don't know. So I, I actually like this move, and I think especially when one of those guys is Andrew Van Ginkle, who you're putting back in plays 
with Brian Dayball, who handpicked Andrew Van Ginkle um, back when he was in Miami, it, it makes so much sense because I, I think Daniel Hunter's a really good player. I think he's going to thrive in Houston. He can win his one-on-ones. He is similar to like a Brian Burns, a Rashawn Gary, that level pass rusher. He's fantastic, but he led the league in sacks last year because of this system, putting five or six more sacks on the stat sheet than he probably would have elsewhere. The amount of stunts and blitz looks, the the manufactured pressure that Brian Dable's, I keep doing that, Brian Flores' mind is going to create for guys like Van Ginkle and Grenard, plus the fact that those guys can win one-on-ones, not quite as good as Daniel Hunter. I like that for the Vikings. And I just, I'm not a DJ Wanham guy. This gets DJ Wanham the fuck off the field. That's a good thing for the Vikings. Like, I actually think with, with Brian Flores, I think Jonathan Grenard plus Andrew Van Ginkle is a better duo for you than Daniel Hunter and DJ Wanham. And now Wanham is also a three. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with what they did. Would have also been good if they just brought Daniel Hunter back, right? I think those were two good options, but I think they were just not quite ready to go all that guaranteed on, on Daniel Hunter. And then they bring in Blake Cashman, one of my favorite signings of the last few days. Blake Cashman, of course, for those that have been around, was a huge my guy. I had him in that draft class in the same tier as a first-round caliber draft pick with Devin White and Devin Bush. Devin White and Devin Bush went in the top 10 of that draft. Blake Cashman fell to like the fifth round because of injury concerns. Well, all three were free agents this year. Two of those players have not been signed, and Blake Cashman has. I He was awesome last year. He broke out, was a Pro Bowl caliber linebacker, and with him, the reason this isn't a lot is really just health, and it was a, a one-year breakout year, but I know his tape is good. It was this good at back when he was playing for the Golden Gophers. He's from Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Hometown hero type. I love this signing for the Vikings. Really hope he can stay healthy, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We saw Jordan Hicks play well last year. I think Blake Cashman has has legit Pro Bowl, all-pro potential if he can stay healthy moving forward. It's a big if. It's a big if. That shoulder has has been an issue for him, but love the signing and the value. Three years, twenty two million, huge thumbs up. So, what the Vikings did? I said I was going to use this as a transition to the Packers. So the Vikings get Aaron Jones as well, which is very self explanatory for them. Aaron Jones for one year, seven million dollars on a revenge signing. What's not to like? And I, I don't even know if the Vikings are going to be that big of threats to the Packers. That they'll compete, of course, and Aaron Jones will help that. Um, but just for the Vikings' sake, like perfect scheme fit, very similar style of offense. From the Packers' perspective, um, and by the way, Aaron Jones in fantasy should be pretty damn good because there's really no one else in Minnesota. They, they have Ty Chandler, but Ty Chandler is just Aaron Jones without vision. So I, you know, Aaron Jones has fantastic vision. For the Packers, I know a lot of people were freaking out about this because Aaron Jones was fantastic down the stretch, and he's not that expensive. And um, honestly, like was better than Josh Jacobs last year. And maybe he still will be a little bit better than Josh Jacobs. I, I don't know about that. I think Josh Jacobs is more of a complete runner in terms of power and all that stuff. But this is more about the Packers wanting a franchise running back. Aaron Jones is 29 years old. He has had durability concerns. I think they had legitimate concerns on if he can hold up. And for a team in the Packers, you know, the Vikings, they're in much more of a risky situation now, right? Like they have Sam Darnold's their quarterback. So it's like, all right, if Sam Darnold somehow hits and Aaron Jones stays healthy, fucking fantastic. We stole Fran, we stole a, a starting quarterback and an, a, a, you know, a top five running back for $17 million total. Um, but the reality is Aaron Jones, at his age, is a health risk. And for the Packers, they look at Josh Jacobs, who's been super durable throughout his career. Part of that is because he's he's got a, you know, he barely ever touched the ball at Alabama. Um, and, you know, he led the league in rushing a year ago. He's 26 years old, signed a four-year deal. He basically signed the exact same deal at the same age as Aaron Jones did three years ago. And that worked out pretty damn well for them. So, 
I think they looked at this and said they're basically spending the same money on Aaron Jones. It's it's an additional probably seven or eight mil cap hit this year, but they get a more durable, more long term option. My first thought was they want that thunder and lightning approach that they've had with Jacob uh, with with Aaron Jones and Dylan. But when you really think about it, Josh Jacobs has been a true bell cow three down back, right? He, he's great on third down, and he's got the power element that Aaron Jones doesn't really have. So he is, and, and what I think, I think what LaFleur realized last year was that he's at his best when A.J. Dillon's hurt and Aaron Jones is just out there all the time, right? Like, that was a huge difference in the offense last year when, like he didn't have to worry about oh we're rotating these guys oh Dylan's out there so the offense knows this is probably a run. The offense is probably better when it's just you've got the bell cow and whatever running back is in there doesn't really dictate to the defense what you're going to do. Um, so I think they're looking at this like no Josh Jacobs is the full package. We don't need a one two punch. We've got Josh Jacobs, and he's going to be a fucking monster in fantasy football. Uh, the only concern there is. Is he fully healthy? So that would be the one holdup. But I really like that signing. And I, I've been saying, like, the Packers are looking for this guy. They've they've held on to Aaron Jones. They love Aaron Jones. He's taken pay cuts to stay after they've kind of said, like, we kind of want to cut you, Aaron. Um, and that's tough to lose that type of character if you're the Packers. But they wanted Jonathan Taylor, right? They drafted A.J. Dillon in the second round. They've been telling you they want this type of back, and they go and get him. So I'm I'm very excited for that for the Packers. And then they get Xavier McKinney. I mean, dude, that's exactly what this defense needed. Uh, not just a safety, but a single high safety. They're going to get to a lot more man coverage, cover three, cover one. They're going to do exactly what Packers fans have been crying for this year. Xavier McKinney played about as many true free safety snaps last year as anybody and he did it at a really high level. They paid a premium to get him, but I think Xavier McKinney is worth it. He's not quite what Jesse Bates was for the Falcons, but it's a similar style approach of like, this is a missing piece we need for our defense. The Falcons were going to that Ryan Nielsen style defense. They needed that free safety. The Packers are doing that with McKinney. Um, and um, now... You know, they've made their splash. Now the Packers are going to do what they do. They have 12 picks. They have their first round. They have two seconds. They have two thirds. And they have two fifths. So they can now look at the draft to fill safety, offensive tackle. You know, they have the freedom to really go with the best player available and continue to just really fill out this extremely exciting young roster. And I wouldn't be stunned as well if they look for a bargain bin safety, a Terrell Edmonds, a Jamal Adams, uh, a strong safety for this system, and maybe they make another splash for Justin Simmons. I, I don't think they would go that route, but if he's getting cheaper and cheaper, they might make a call. We did see them sign three big free agents in that first year when Goot stepped in, but I think both these signings were perfect because I do think they both filled needs. I do think running back was a need. I do. I've been saying it. People disagreed with me when I said that, but it's like, dude, Aaron Jones is an injury-prone 29-year-old running back, and they wanted premium back. They got one. Needed a free safety. So, um, yeah, got to be excited about what Green Bay did, and I think it really continues to build their hype for next year. Uh, the only other thing left to say is they did release or are set to release Devondre Campbell. I'm curious what they do at linebacker there. I do like Isaiah McDuffie. I think he could be a number two for them. He's had to do that plenty of times for them. Um, Quay Walker, though, is going to have to step up as a number one in year three. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. Uh, but overall, very exciting for Green Bay. Then we've got the Detroit Lions. Not necessarily the aggressive, splashy offseason that they could have decided to go with yet. We'll see. They, there's still an opportunity for them to go, you know, make some phone calls and 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 either sign some players or make some more trades. But they did make one move that kind of flew under the radar as everything was happening. But what a perfect addition to go get Carlton Davis. I mean, holy shit. This is like as a Packers fan, I saw that and I was like, oh, man, that sucks. Uh, Carlton Davis just for, for one has played 
unbelievable football when he plays against Green Bay. But, like, he put Devontae Adams in a box a lot of times. But, uh, I mean, that's exactly the type of corner that Detroit wants and needed. A physical press man corner, fits Aaron Glenn's system, fits the culture, you know, plays the run. It just a... A perfect addition. And now they don't have to go first round corner if they don't want, right? Like if they fall in love with a Darius Robinson or want a receiver, like they can do a lot of different stuff in the first. And then I think they also brought back Sutton, which was smart. Uh, or um, not Sutton. Um, the other guy they signed, the Torres ACL. Why, why can't I think of uh, – came from – Came from the Niners. We're, we're two hours, 15 minutes into this bad boy, so I'm not going to apologize, but I do want to get this name right because um, Emmanuel Mosley, they brought him back on a one-year deal. You got Sutton. You got Brian Branch. I do think if they rolled into next year with those guys, it could be worse. And maybe a draft a corner round two or something, but um, love that addition for Detroit. He filled their biggest need. Uh, did cost a third round pick, so it's not cheap, but I make that trade every day of the week for Detroit. And then they also signed Marcus Davenport. I, I think that's a nice little dart throw. Just hasn't been able to stay healthy, right? But there's a connection there. Played for Aaron Glenn in New Orleans. And, um, you know, between Davenport and, and, um, uh, oh, come on. I'm going to have to check the depth chart again. It's right next to me, I guess. Uh, the edge rusher, James Houston, who emerged as a, a six-round rookie and then was hurt last year. Between James Houston and and Davenport here, if you could get one of those guys to stay healthy, you at least have someone with some juice opposite of, of um, Hutchinson. Man, the brain is really getting fried at this point, but we've been going a long time. So let's wrap up with the Chicago Bears. And... You know, I, I get them getting Jalen Johnson back was was their A plus free agent signing. They came real close to losing him. They didn't, and he wasn't even that expensive. I think because some of the 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 time missed, he's missed a couple games every year. I think that bit that was a little bit baked into his AAV a little bit. But I love getting him back because that secondary now is, I mean, really the defense as a whole, just locked and loaded, ready to go. They don't really they don't go get a Daniel Hunter. They don't really make a big splash for an edge. And maybe they're, you know, thinking about Hassan Reddick or something like that. But you know, I do think that puts a Dallas Turner or a Lyo Tulatu or a Jared First much more in play for them at number nine. But other than that and, and interior D line, you know, like essentially their defense is looking good and their secondary is Locked and loaded, ready to go. We already, we already had talked about this with the ideal fits. They bring in Kevin Bayard. Like I'm, I'm I think those were really good moves for the uh, for the, the secondary that needed to be full, um, filled. I'll just say filled. Other than that, you know, they've been a little more quiet than I think we might have expected. I think they might have could have been a little bit more aggressive, but they go and get Gerald Everett as a tight end too. I actually like that move from a football perspective. Probably not going to get a lot of yards, not going to get a lot of targets, not going to be very involved. But uh, talking about, you know, um, Shane Waldron coming in, who had Noah Fant, he had Colby Parkinson, he had Will Disley. He really did use those guys, moved them around, used play action to get guys like Noah Fant schemed open. Everett's going to be a really good fit as that wing tight end, just as Noah Fant was. So that makes a ton of sense. Two years, $12 million. It's been good for the Chargers, so I like that signing just to get a little bit more juice in there. And then um, the one move that I really didn't get, you know, this and the Brandon Jones signing for Denver were like the two deals where I was like, and maybe the maybe the Darnell Savage deal in Jacksonville, but those were deals where I was like, like, why? <laughs> you know, DeAndre Swift comes in as just another one of these backs, You've already got Khalil Herbert, who I think is a better running back than DeAndre Swift as a runner. Uh, Roshan Johnson, who, again, better running back than DeAndre Swift, in my opinion. Swift is a better pass catcher. But it's just like, I, I just, I mean, I know you're probably set to lose Herbert. And you see Swift as that third down piece. It's really not the end of the world. But I just, I, I can't get excited about DeAndre Swift anymore. I used to in Detroit, but... 
his vision is some of the worst in the league. He's bounce heavy. He fumbles the ball. He has no power. He's not a tough player. I would have given DeAndre Swift a one-year $5 million deal, not a two-year $24 million deal. I just... I would have rather taken that money and a little extra and tried to get Darnell Mooney back. You know? So I, I wasn't super excited about that, but it's not that they've had a bad offseason. So we made it. Deep breaths. I should probably end this before my computer just crashes. We've literally been going for two hours, 25 minutes. Thank you so much for listening, for watching. And this is the last you'll hear from me for a little under a week. I'm going to Mexico with Anna, my wife. So make sure you get caught up on my Edge Rush rankings video. And you can follow along with my draft evals and analysis via my draft guide there on Patreon. But uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to head out. And thank you for watching. We'll see you later. Peace out. <laughs>